This episode will guide you through the issues of the Uncanny X-Men published in 1982. Issue 153. This issue starts off with Cyclops, Wolverine and Colossus doing repair work on the mansion, which has been damaged heavily while in battle with the Hellfire Club. We also find Storm and Carol Danvers talking about what had happened, while Carol takes care of Storm's wounds. Professor X and Nightcrawler exchange thoughts and both express their concerns with how to take care of all the damage and how to repair it, lacking the financial means and expertise. At a certain point, Kitty Pride, the youngest and newest member of the X-Men, pops up out of the ceiling to call Colossus, since it's time for Colossus' sister Ilyana to go to sleep. We find out Ilyana is scared of bad things happening. Kitty and Colossus joke around a little bit and try and relieve some of the tension and Ileana asks Kitty to tell a bedtime story. She likes her storytelling the best. Now the biggest part of this issue shows the fairy tale Kitty thought up. There are some noteworthy elements, but I will skip over most of it. Most of the characters involved in this fairy tale are based on the X-Men's looks or personality traits. We see Kitty and Colossus' character fighting side by side. They help out Xavier and Cyclops' character being bothered by crooks. Then they get attacked by an evil version of Jean Grey's character as the Dark Phoenix. An X-Men a very much loved character who has died in previous issues. Kitty then summons her dragon, which is an obvious play at the Blackbird airplane the X-Men use. The dragon is called Lockheed, which will get an additional meaning later on. In between Kitty's storytelling, we switch over to the X-Men in the mansion, eavesdropping on Kitty's story for Eliana. At first it's only Nightcrawler and Wolverine, who over time have become close friends, and they will get joined by Storm and Carol, and eventually by Cyclops and Professor X. When the story is done, Ileana apparently has fallen asleep, so Colossus and Kitty silently exit her bedroom. They are surprised to find the whole of the X-Men team outside and Kitty is somewhat embarrassed. Cyclops especially thanks Kitty for the nice story because it featured his now dead lover Jean with a happy ending. Something which did not happen the same way in real life, so the story and its ending had a special meaning to Scott. Issue 154. When this issue begins, we see Aurora and Scott in the Storm and Cyclops uniforms playing a game in the Danger Room to perfect the control over their skills. It's quite a competitive game, as Cyclops mentions that neither one of them had an advantage over the other with more than one point difference. Scott also mentions, somewhat jokingly, how he has to get used to having a rival. Obviously this is a play at Aurora being the team leader now, ever since Scott had left the team. We then switch to outer space and find Corsair, identified as Christopher Summers, who happens to be the leader of the Star Jammers, making his way back to Earth after being away for 20 some years. While Corsair is lost in thought about his son, home planet and his dreams of exploring space, he gets alarmed by the onboard scanners warning him of a Shi'ar dreadnought. Apparently he was being chased by them, since he mentions how they have found him. In the next interlude, we catch Colossus, his little sister Eliana, Nightcrawler and Professor X moving into one of Magneto's old bases. Nightcrawler is thinking about whether it's a good idea to move into this place, for little kids like Eliana or the X-Men in general. Charles responds with telepathy and Kurt is surprised by this. Professor X apologizes and says that Kurt's thoughts were so strong that he couldn't help but picking up his thoughts. Charles tells Nightcrawler that with all the anti-mutant sentiments going on in the United States, moving here might actually be safer now. Apart from that, this old base of Magneto has his records and thus presents a nice opportunity to learn about the X-Men's arch nemesis. Nightcrawler tells Professor X that he hopes so, but also that his place gives him the creeps. Next we see Carol Danvers, who used to be Miss Marvel before her powers and part of her memories got stolen, when she almost died in battle with the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, specifically Rogue, looking out over the surroundings from one of the towers in the structure. We see her thinking about it, how it might have been better for her to have perished at the hands of Rogue, since it's hard for her to realize she has lost so much and feels very out of place. She's being approached by Wolverine, and he startles her because she didn't hear him. She asks him if they had met years before, and Wolverine confirms they had, and that her partner and Wolverine had done some missions together. Carol doesn't remember any of this, which is very frustrating to her. Wolverine tries to calm her down some, but then gets interrupted by Kitty, who got sent by Professor X to find Wolverine. 
Right before we go back to Cyclops and Storm in the mansion, we see a short instance of Corsair being really close to Earth and getting shot at by presumably the Shi'ar. Cyclops is preparing a meal for him and Storm, and thinks to himself he has outdone himself. But then again his sailors are pretty low. While having dinner they are going through the mail. Storm reads a postcard sent by Kitty, saying how she got sunburned and is practicing her dancing skills to get a part in the piece choreographed by Stevie Hunter. Scott jokes how that's quite a postcard. Storm responds by saying Kitty writes really small. Scott himself is reading a letter by Emma Frost, the White Queen of the Hellfire Club and a head teacher of the Massachusetts Academy, concerning the revoking of Kitty's admission to that school. This refers to an earlier altercation between the X-Men and the White Queen, and also the promise of the White Queen made at the end of the same altercation regarding Kitty's enlisting. Kitty will now officially be with the Xavier School for at least one more year. Storm compliments Scott on the meal he made and how he underrates himself. She also asks Scott whether he wants to reclaim his leadership position on the X-Men team, because of the comment he made earlier about Storm being his rival. He then replies by asking if she wants to give it up. Aurora then says how she's not certain, and somewhat reluctant took the role when Scott left the team, and that the responsibility frightened her. She also mentions that over the months she accepted it and became good at it, but also says that Scott was the best. Scott thanks her for the compliment and says he's not entirely sure he wants the job back, how things have changed and is changing, and that it feels like he's at a crossroads. At that moment their conversation is interrupted by a loud roaring sound. They rush outside to find a spacecraft crashing down, luckily in a nearby lake. They dive in the water wearing oxygen masks and communication devices and look for survivors. While they do this, Aurora is wondering how they will explain the situation if it ever comes to light. Scott says how she's the boss and she will figure something out. They find and rescue the pilot and come to the same conclusion, namely that it's Corsair. Someone they met at an earlier time while they had one of their adventures in space. At this moment in time, Scott is not aware just how Corsair is related to him. Aurora does know, but she made a promise not to reveal that secret. She wonders how this might just be the right time to do so. At that moment the spacecraft explodes, solving the potential problem of having to explain the situation. We then see the dream or nightmare that Corsair is having, right before he gains consciousness. We basically see him as a pilot of an airplane that's crashing down, with his wife and two sons. His wife, Anne, gave the only parachute to her oldest son Scott and wrapped her younger son Alex in Scott's arms and pushed him out of the plane. Apparently after that Corsair and his wife were abducted by the Shi'ar, something which Anne did not survive. Later, not so long ago, Corsair and his four star jammers were ambushed by the Shi'ar Imperial Troopers. They made a quick decision and sent Corsair and Ruth to Earth to warn the X-Men. The star jammer members Raza, Chod and Mamsel Hepzibah remained behind to cover Corsair's tracks. He then wakes up to Cyclops and Storm, both in uniform. He apologizes for dropping in unannounced, but is cut short by Cyclops asking him how he got the Air Force dog tags and the locket with pictures of Anne, Scott and Alex. Corsair then tells Cyclops that the tags are his, and the woman is his wife and the kids are his sons. Scott shouts to Corsair how he's lying. Storm chimes in by saying she's sorry, but Corsair is not lying. Scott is being surprised about this, asks how Storm would know that. At that moment a Citroen hunter breaks through the window. Corsair says they are here for him, and Scott says they'll have to wait until he's done with Corsair. What happens next, while the Citroen hunters are crawling through every door and window of the Xavier mansion, is a violent cat and mouse game between the Citroen on one end and Storm, Cyclops and Corsair on the other. Storm's worried about Corsair's allegiance and is concerned for his own life versus his surroundings when he mentions that they could use a good sized fusion bomb to tear down the Citroen's matrix. She knows that he's joking, but there's also a seriousness in his voice. The house gets ravaged by the attack and we see Corsair wondering about where the Cedri came from, since they are freelance bounty hunters and the Shear would never employ them. Scott is having an internal monologue about meeting his long thought lost father and not sure how to act. This is being noticed by Storm, who feels guilty about not telling Scott to try and spare him the hurt, yet in doing so possibly giving him more pain. The three of them try and come up with a plan on how to deal with the threat of the Cedri invading the mansion. Storm and Cyclops decide to try and draw away the Cedri from the civilians surrounding the vicinity. They do this by leaving Storm behind, while Corsair and Cyclops retreat to the Blackbird. Corsair thinks this is a ridiculous plan to leave Storm alone against the army of Cedri, and while Scott punches Corsair in the face, telling him basically the decision has been made and that Corsair should shut up. Just about when Aurora is about to lose a grip on the situation, Scott chimes in saying how they are ready for liftoff. 
At that signal, Storm uses her elemental powers to create a flood to deal with the sea tree, and in her last breath she flies to the blackbird. A tactical maneuver Scott would not be able to pull off. As they fly away from the hangar, Scott makes a final pass over the mansion to gather as much data as possible, and sees the mansion is in total ruins being covered in sea tree. While Scott is telling Storm and Corsair to keep an eye open for the Seedry ship in hope of being able to take it out, Corsair tells the Sun to take another good look at the Seedry, because they don't need a ship, they are a ship, as we see them all merging together in a spaceship. We then switch over to air traffic control personnel being startled by what they see forming on their radar and are worried because the unidentified flying objects are heading due New York City. All the while the Seedry ship is in pursuit of the Blackbird firing laser beams at them. Cyclops tries to outmaneuver their attackers and while he does so, he tries out the newly installed experimental cockpit's windshield. Scott's mutant ability of firing force blasts from his eyes has a special interaction with this material called ruby quartz, the same material his visor is made out of. In this case, apparently, the composed material the windshield is made out of has a polarizing property of amplifying Scott's eye beams, same as a ruby wood with light in a laser. However, amplification or not, it has little or no effect on the sea tree ship. Corsair explains to the Cyclops and Storm why that is and what they would need to have the desired effect. Corsair compliments Cyclops on his flying skills and that he could not have done better himself while calling him his son. Scott is having none of that and shuts it down by saying his name is Cyclops and our Corsair doesn't have any right calling him differently. Storm comes up with a plan to defeat the sea tree by hitting them from both sides. Storm with her elemental powers and Cyclops with his optic blast. While Storm is flying around she has an internal monologue, wondering whether their survival is worth the risk it might be to the civilians in the surrounding area, both through the Seedry attack as well as Storm's own attacks and Cyclops' beams. She is also very aware of her being a lot more fragile outside the Blackbird than inside. A helicopter of the NYPD is being attacked by the Seedry, totally destroyed for coming too close and being mistaken for an attacker. Storm does her best to rescue two policemen inside and is successful in doing so. The battle continues and the duration of the fight causes the Seedry's matrix to collapse. The Seedry spaceship breaks down into smaller Seedry hunters and crashes down into a petroleum storage facility. This is being evacuated by the personnel working there. At this moment Corsair proposes to cause an explosion and kill all the Seedry. This causes some confusion in Cyclops because he didn't know they were alive and he thought they were all machines. He also mentions that he can't kill them. Corsair then responds by saying that he can't have any scruples about this and that they have to act now because he can't allow the Seedry hunters to combine again into a bigger enemy. At this moment Storm enters back into the Blackbird and while the hatch is open Corsair shoots his gun and causes an explosion in the petroleum storage facility. With this situation being dealt with the three end up into a discussion about the workers working there, the effects on the environment and the global threat of the Seedry. Corsair can only respond by saying well it doesn't really matter how many people might have died, he's trying to save a whole world here. This world, the Earth. Storm and Cyclops then demand an explanation about what Corsair actually means by saving this world. We then see a little flashback concerning a meeting of the Shi'ar Grand Council, which was being raided by terrorist commando forces. Corsair says that most of the miniatures were slaughtered there, and some even executed after they had surrendered. We also see that the Magistrix of the Shi'ar Empire, Lelandra, was kidnapped and that Corsair and the Star Jammers were implicated. He also mentions that the trail left by the terrorists led straight to Earth. At this time, a fast battle force led by Chancellor Araki and Admiral Samadar set out to immediately rescue Lilandra and that their forces were already closing in on Earth. Corsair mentions that these Shi'ar will go to any length to save their Empress and that they don't care about the Earth being destroyed. Issue 155 This issue picks up where the previous issue left off. Namely with Storm, Cyclops and Corsair aboard the Blackbird flying away from the scenery where they had battled the sea tree. Obviously there's a tension brewing, since Scott not only just found out that Corsair the space pirate and leader of the Star Jammers is his father, but his teammate Storm has known about this, yet swore to Cyclops' lover Jean not to divulge the secret. While Scott and Corsair are having an argument about Corsair's motivations to not return to Earth and his sons, the Blackbird starts to glow and is being transported away, apparently by the Shi'ar Imperial Guard and Shi'ar combat troopers. At that same moment, Professor X and the X-Men materialize next to them. 
Colossus and Wolverine enter battle mode, but Professor X tells him to calm down. He also finds out from Cyclops' thoughts that Corsair is Scott's father. They are all welcomed by Gladiator of the Shi'ar Burial Guard and Lord Chancellor Araki and Admiral Samadar. Samadar regards Earthlings as barbarians to a Shi'ar standards and is surprised by the respect these Earthlings receive. Araki explains to him why that is. While Professor X tries to calm down his X-Men, we see a display of Wolverine's short view several times. Charles demands an audience with Lelandra, the Majestrix or Empress of the Shi'ar Empire, with whom he has a long-distance, galaxy-spanning relationship. Chancellor Araki tells Charles that this is not possible and he'll explain why. In a nearby briefing room, the X-Men see a portrayal of the abduction of Lelandra, just like Corsair had told Cyclops and Storm. Professor X wonders if Lelandra could be dead, which he doubts because of the psychic report that do have, meaning he would have noticed if she had died. Charles expresses his concerns and asks Araki who, why and where. Wolverine chimes in saying, who cares, it's not our problem, it's a Shi'ar problem. He's then being corrected on how it's very much of their problem since the trail leads to Earth. Cyclops asks the Shi'ar what they plan on doing about it, and the Rocky responds by saying, liberate her if she's alive, avenge her if she's not. Corsa will get punished for being a conspirator, and that they will use Xavier to trace her through the bond they have. Once they have, they will send the Imperial Guard and combat troopers to effect her release. Professor Xavier, being the Imperial escort, forbids this course of action, as it will most likely result in Lelander's death and destruction of lives and property on Earth. Once again, the Admiral expresses his ideas on humans, how they're barbarians, and how their lives mean nothing to the Shi'ar. Xavier still objects and asks Admiral Semidar whether he truly wants to go against Charles's lawful decree. Lord Chancellor Araki confirms Charles' claims and grants the X-Men some leeway, 24 hours, to try their own approach in finding and liberating Lelandra. And as a guarantee, he will require two of Xavier's students as temporary hostages. Xavier asks if that's really necessary and if Araki doubts Charles' words. Araki responds by saying, these are dangerous times and he trusts nothing and no one. Charles asks Cyclops first and later Storm for their input in these matters. Storm notices this and thinks to herself precisely that which she and Cyclops had been talking about earlier regarding her position as a team leader. The decision is made and they decide that Nightcrawler and Kitty will take roles as hostages. While they say their goodbyes, Xavier mind links with Kitty and telepathically info dumps everything Charles knows about the Shi'ar in Kitty's mind. This sudden flux of data overwhelms Kitty and she faints due to it. Xavier telepathically tells Kurt that he has a task in mind for the two of them. Nightcrawler responds by saying Charles can count on him and tells them goodbye, while the X-Men are being transported back home. With the mansion being totally destroyed by the Seagree, Xavier is shocked by seeing the mansion in the state it is in. The X-Men regroup in a nearby Avengers mansion. They wanted to ask the Avengers for their help with the current threat facing humanity, but they find only the newest member Tigra and the Avengers' butler Jarvis. The rest of the Avengers members are apparently currently busy. The X-Men also reach out to the Fantastic Four, but they seem to not be available either. Wolverine and Colossus, in the company of Tigra, are discussing how they're wasting time looking for help, and that they're on their own as usual. Colossus tells Wolverine that they're at least on Earth and among friends, unlike Kitty and Kurt. Tigra tries to cheer them up, and Wolverine pretty much makes clear that he's not in the mood to joke around. And the two end up in a little fight with Colossus in the middle, right as they're being joined by the rest of the X-Men and Jarvis. Cyclops comments on Tigra and Wolverine's behavior, while Jarvis brings some tea and sandwiches as he comments on the professors not looking so good. Jarvis, being worried, urges Charles to get some rest. Xavier says that he'll be alright and he's mostly worn out due to having tried to establish contact with Lelandra. He says that this was anticipated by their unknown enemies and that he ended up in a psionic ambush, which he barely managed to escape. He did, however, manage to get a rough location fixed on Lelandra. She appears to be in New York as well. Charles mentions he will give it another try once he's more rested up and he asks where Corsair is, because he would like to ask him some questions. Wolverine responds by saying that Corsair and Storm are both apparently not in the Avengers mansion right now. At this moment we switch over to Kitty and Kurt. Kitty is pretty much overwhelmed by the sight she has from one of the observation posts aboard the Shi'ar ship. They have a small talk about how they must do their best in their part of helping saving the Earth from the current Shi'ar threat. 
Kurt notices Kitty is shivering and asks her why she has not changed into something else than a bathing suit. Kitty takes Nightcrawler to one of the devices the Shuar have on board, which makes clothes. Nightcrawler is pleased to see that Kitty is taking their imprisonment well, and Kitty responds by saying that while the Shuar think Kitty is playing dress up with the new toy she received, she's actually been using Professor X's knowledge dump to tap into the Shuar computer systems. She also mentions that with that knowledge, access to the computers and both their mutant ability to teleport anywhere and face through walls and objects, they can basically do anything. Then we switch to Corsair and Storm walking around in New York City. Corsair mentions how everything's changed since he's last been on Earth. Yet how everything seems so outdated compared to what he's seen across the galaxy as a star jammer, and that his homeworld isn't his world anymore. Storm responds by saying how she's heard similar sentiments from Colossus, being a farm boy and now an X-Men, and how it would be hard for him to go back to his old way of life, and how that probably goes for all the X-Men. Corsair then continues about how Cyclops was right in saying that Corsair should have returned for his sons, and how he died inside after his wife and their mother, Catherine Ann, died. Storm mentions to Corsair that Cyclops would understand how he felt, to which Corsair responds that no, he would not, since you would have to have lived through the situation like that to be able to understand it. Corsair then asks about why Jean Grey, the former X-Men and lover of Cyclops named Phoenix, isn't there with them. To Corsair's surprise, Storm tells him that Jean's dead. He instantly feels sorry for Scott and asks how this has happened. We see some sort of ray gun being aimed at Corsair from a construction site. We see a conversation between two figures about how they could instantly take out Corsair and Storm. One of the alien figures mentions how they seem like prime specimen, fit for the mother of us all, and how destroying them seems like a waste. The other figure wards the alien with a gun how Corsair and Storm are dangerous and probably even and probably even to the mother. They have a short discussion about their allegiance and about respecting and fearing the powers of both Storm and Corsair. One of them goes airborne, while the one with the gun shouts, the brute fear nothing, while firing the gun. Apparently the gun, called the Size Cream, has an hallucinogenic effect on Storm and Corsair, drawing out their subconscious biggest hates and fears while they are being attacked by the second figure who turns out to be Deathbird, who proclaims herself the new Empress of the Shi'ar. Deathbird gets shot out of the sky by Cyclops' I-Beam, who just arrived on the scene, together with Tigra, Professor X, Wolverine and Colossus. While Deathbird falls, she is being intercepted by Tigra, who thinks she is fully aware of how dangerous Deathbird is. She jokes around about cats and birds, but Deathbird is not impressed. They fight mid-air, and Tigra realizes she's out of her league. Deathbird initiates another attack of an energy bolt and aims it at Professor X. Colossus jumps in the way and his skin reflects the energy blast into a nearby car. The owner of the car is calling the police. Cyclops and Professor X decide on tactics how to deal with Deathbird. Scott keeps blasting his eye beams and Deathbird takes cover in the construction site. Storm and Corsair, still under the influence of the ice cream, have started attacking each other. They are being separated by Cyclops and Colossus. While Corsair's anger focuses on Cyclops because he thinks Cyclops to be the Shi'ar Emperor who killed his wife. While Cyclops is being strangled by Corsair, Professor X uses his mutant ability to enter both Corsair and Storm's minds and counter the Size Cream's effects. Apparently this seems to be a whole lot easier than it actually was. While father and son gather the bearings, Scott informs Corsair that he and Storm had been attacked by Deathbird and the alien with his ray gun. Corsair mentions how Deathbird is precisely the reason he came to Earth, since he learned she seems to be the guiding force behind the rebellion against Majestic Solandra. Storm and Corsair, both not liking the fact their minds have been abused, immediately initiated pursuit. The brute alien observes how Charles Xavier is the leader and the telepath and is curious how the size screen would affect Professor X. At that moment, the brute is being confronted by Wolverine, who just popped his adamantium claws. A short one-sided fight ensues, and we see the ray gun drop down, as it is being caught by yet another brute. The gun is being fired at Storm, and she gets snared by some kind of tangle web, which is apparently part of the gun's arsenal. Storm stays in the air, even though she's ensnared, because her mutant abilities manipulate all weather, and she doesn't need her limbs to conjure up a wind. However, being ensnared causes Storm to lose focus due to her claustrophobia. 
At that moment, another sniper presents himself, shooting another gun at Professor X. Once again, Colossus instinctively jumps in between, but this time it's by a yet again different material. It's some kind of small acid bomb which is burning through Colossus's uniform, and also apparently his metal skin. Colossus mentions how it burns, and Xavier uses his psi power to help Colossus deal with the pain. Cyclops, being a tactician, notices how the two shots took out two X-Men. He tells Tigra to die for Storm and swing her to Wolverine, who releases Storm from her entrapment, who in turn saves Tigra from a high fall. Returning to the ground, Storm uses her weather manipulation powers to vaporize the acid on Colossus' chest with a lightning bolt and to wash it away with a monsoon. Colossus is thankful for the help and mentions that he will join the battle as soon as he's recovered. Cyclops dismisses him and tells him to stay with Charles and to take care of him, while the rest of them engage Deathbird and her henchmen. Meanwhile, we see Wolverine fighting with another member of the brood. He had been hunting the snipers in the construction site, leading him towards the basement, where he had also seen Corsair go. Corsair happens to find himself in a confrontation of firearms with several brood, down in the basement. The X-Men and Tigra arrive just in time, as father and son, Corsair and Cyclops, share a moment of reconciliation. The X-Men and Tigra arm themselves with alien weaponry and unleash their firepower. When the dust settles, they are confronted by Deathbird, who is holding Professor X hostage. She threatens to hurt Charles unless the X-Men stand down. They do so and Deathbird throws one of her exploding javelins. At which time a starship, which was being camouflaged by the construction site, launches itself into space, with the whole construction site collapsing in on itself, with the X-Men being covered by the debris. They all are working towards a way out, apart from Storm, who once again is overcome by a claustrophobic fear of being buried alive. Cyclops blasts them away clear, and they fan out to find Colossus, since they didn't know what happened with him when Professor X got taken hostage by Deathbird. They find him lying on the ground with one of Deathbird's javelins pierced through his back, all the way through his chest. At that time, while the X-Men are worried about Professor's health and they're calling out for someone to call an ambulance, the X-Men are being put under arrest by the New York Police Department. Issue 156 As seen at the end of the previous issue, Colossus is lying on the ground after being pierced by one of Deathbird's javelins. He's being surrounded by his fellow X-Men, Corsair of the Starjammers and Tigra of the Avengers. The police had just arrived to put the X-Men under arrest for the damage to the city, which had been caused by their battle with Deathbird and the Brood. Tigra is recapping what had happened in her mind and, as an Avenger, wonders how she would explain this to the police. The police are giving her a hard time. We then switch over to the FAA, Air Traffic Control Center, where once again a UFO is spotted on the radars, much like a couple of days before. They try and make sure that every commercial airplane is moving out of the area, because the UFO that materializes is apparently huge. The spaceship fires a beam, thought to be some kind of death ray, straight at the X-Men and Corsair, who disappear, leaving Tigra behind. Once the X-Men materialize aboard the ship, they find out it belongs to the Starjammers, Corsair's band of pirates who apparently had escaped from the Shi'ar Imperial Army after Corsair had left them behind. Cyclops mentions how Colossus is still on the verge of death and asks if Corsair's crew can help them. Corsair says that they will try and that it's up to Colossus being hooked up to a life support module and their medic, a flying robot named Sikorsky. Sikorsky does a quick scan and finds that Colossus is severely hurt and his life is at risk. Scott says that he won't allow Colossus to die, and Corsair asks him whether he's God, and that he has stood over bodies and friends before, so he knows how it feels to be powerless and can only hope and pray Colossus makes it. We then catch up with Kitty and Kurt, who are still being held captive by the Shi'ar as hostages, while the X-Men try and find Lilandra within 24 hours. Kitty is still enjoying the costume making device aboard the ship. The Shi'ar guard mentions how they have been behaving as model prisoners. No problems at all, apart from Kitty's constant talking. 
Suddenly a hologram pops up. It's Admiral Lord Samadar asking the two X-Men whether the accommodations are satisfactory. Kurt confirms this and asks what the reason for the call is. Samadar gives an update on what's going on in Earth and shows images of the battle with Deathbird. But also of Colossus being attacked by acid first and then stabbed through his chest. Kitty thinks to herself how it's all been very much to Summoner's liking that the X-Men had been in a rough battle with Deathbird, but also likes to show Colossus being hurt badly and the effect it has on Kitty and Kurt. She's not wrong in thinking that, because we see Samadar in a call with Deathbird, discussing their deal, hindering the X-Men from being successful in liberating Lalandra and thus destroying the Earth for revenge, and that if Chancellor Araki or any of the Imperial Guard disprove that, they will be dealt with. Samadar also tells Deathbird that she has only been partially successful in hindering the X-Men, since they have now joined forces with the Star Jammers. Deathbird mentions that Samadar has been paid royally and she expects value for money. Apparently Charles has been drugged and he's having some sort of fever dream. While he's waking up from his nightmare, his mind is making up distorted images of an alien figure resembling the brute, slowly changing into the face of the woman he loves. At this moment we find out that not only Professor X, but also his lover, the majestic Solandra, are aboard Deathbird's ship, which is making its way through space. Charles voices his doubts whether it's really Lalandra, and she confirms she is. Charles scans her mind and cannot find any trace of any alien psychic anomaly. They talk about the dangers death proposes and Lalandra's influence in Charles' life and the loss of two students, namely Jean Grey the Phoenix earlier and now Colossus. While they are exchanging words on how they would not have missed their time together regardless of the losses that came with it, they get interrupted by Deathbird, who offers Lalandra, her sister, freedom in exchange for the throne of the Shi'ar Empire. Lalandra attacks Deathbird, but Deathbird easily deals with her. Charles asks how Deathbird is related to Lalandra and the Shi'ar, and Lalandra explains how Deathbird was the firstborn and rightful heir to the throne until she was stripped from her rank due to a crime she committed. While Lalandra is alive, Deathbird cannot become the Empress. We then switch to Cyclops and Corsair looking out on the vastness of space, aboard the Star Jammer. Scott informs on the status of both Colossus in the sickbay and Deathbird's trace. Corsair tells Scott that Colossus is still not doing well and it's only a matter of time before they catch up to Deathbird's spacecraft. Corsair tells Scott that he heard about the loss of Jean from Storm. Scott tells him how he felt lost and alone, like his heart and soul were ripped out of him, to which Corsair responds that all things will pass in time, even grief. Scott then asks Corsair what had happened when he was young and got split up with his brother from his mom and dad. Corsair retells the story of being attacked by a UFO, how he told his wife Catherine Ann to save both kids with but a single parachute and how they got abducted by the Shi'ar. The Shi'ar abducted them for both study and pleasure. Corsair was separated from his wife and sent to the slave pens, which he eventually escaped. He then set out to find Anne, who had been taken in by the then Shi'ar Emperor Diken as a sex slave. Corsair found them and instead of shooting him, he tried to take out Diken with his bare hands, a mistake he still regrets. Guards came to Diken's rescue and Corsair was once again captured and about to be executed on the spot. Diken puts a halt to his execution because he wants Corsair, a barbarian in his eyes, to suffer by stabbing Catherine Anne right there in front of Corsair's eyes. After that, Corsair gets sent to the Star Pits, where he met Chode, Raza, and Mamsel Hatsibab, with whom he became friends and eventually stole the Star Jammer to escape from Shi'ar enslavement and had been fighting with them ever since. Scott thanks his dad for sharing the story. They seem to be growing closer. At that moment they get informed by Hepzibah that they are closing in on Deathbird's ship. Surprised by the fact that Deathbird's ship doesn't try to escape, they find out why, as suddenly a massive craft appears, seemingly out of nowhere. This huge spacecraft envelops both the Star Jammer as Deathbird's ship, and docking cradles form from out of the interior walls, to allow a cadre of brute troopers to seize the Star Jammer and its passengers. To their surprise, the airlock blows off. Colossus apparently recovered and slammed the airlock right off, smashing some of the brood. Wolverine, Colossus and Raza charge out of the ship as a first line of attack, followed by Storm, Hepzibah and Chode. It becomes clear that Storm, even though she senses evil all around her, is motivated to not kill the brood, since she pledged to never take a life. The Star Jammers do not share this concern and Raza tells Storm to stand aside if she cannot kill the enemy. 
Storm conjures up a blizzard inside the alien vessel. Storm conjures up a blizzard inside the alien vessel and it seems to respond to it as if in pain. The brute counter the attack by initiating a zero gravity environment, making it harder for the X-Men and Starjammers to stand their ground and become easier targets. The brute aimed to use both teams as hosts for the Mother Queen. Raza hands Colossus grip soles, which allow him to adhere to any surface. Colossus thanks him and mentions Cyclops and Corsair's mission. We then switch to Professor Xavier and Empress Lelandra's halting cell, which is being opened by several brute with ray guns who are about to incinerate the both of them. Luckily for them, they are being rescued by the time by Cyclops and Corsair. Professor X, paralyzed, but taking the advantage of the zero gravity field, launches himself towards the two and tells them to get down, as more brutes were attacking from behind. Scott is telling Xavier to be more careful, but Charles had his reason to jump out of his holding cell because he wanted to escape from the inhibitor field, dampening his mental powers. But he also felt the urge to act since the brute had been threatening his and Lelander's life. While they move on, they get joined by the others. They wonder about the architectural structure of the ship and Professor X expresses his relief to see Colossus alive. We then switch over to Storm, who is in battle with Deathbird. Deathbird asks Storm why she's even defending or trying to rescue Lelandra, since Lelandra is directly responsible for the execution of Storm's good friend, the Phoenix. And she says that they should be allies rather than enemies. Storm declines Deathbird's threat to join her or die, since no matter what she thinks of Lelandra, Deathbird is much worse. During their fight, one of Deathbird's javelins is stuck in the vessel's walls and Storm notices how there's a liquid oozing from the walls. She finds out it's actually blood and concludes that the vessel is not just a manner of transportation, but actually a living being. With Storm being distracted, Deathbird push kicks Storm and tells one of her brute henchmen to open a portal in the wall. With Storm adrift in outer space, the Starjammers and the rest of the X-Men analyze the situation and Waldo concludes she'll die if she's not rescued within 30 seconds. They start up the Starjammer and blast through the alien vessel's walls. They rescue Storm in time, and when Storm recovers, she's relieved to see Cyclops' plan to liberate Charles and Lelandra work well. She tells everyone that she found out the vessel is a living creature, and may have been hurt severely in the process. Charles wonders if the vessel is an ally or a slave to the brood. Waldo chimes in by saying he's not registering any higher order brain functions, consciousness or self-awareness, and has presumably been deliberately destroyed. The balance is made up regarding the repairs needed to the Starjammer to be able to return to Earth. And it turns out repair work will need about 24 hours. Conclusions are that that will not be enough, since there's only less than 6 hours left before Chancellor Araki's deadline will have run out. Issue 157 We follow the X-Men and Starjammers doing repair work in mid-space on the spacecraft when this issue starts. Each member of each team uses their ability or skill to lend a hand in the necessary work, while some of them have a conversation regarding the current status of the threat the Shi'ar posed to life on Earth and their previous adventures, specifically Colossus's recent near-death. At a certain moment there's a small explosion and Wolverine gets blown away from the Starjammer, with his spacesuit's backpack thrusters being damaged. Momsel Hepzibab immediately jumps to the rescue, mentioning how it would be near impossible to use the onboard scanners to find Wolverine amidst the flying debris. Woody drifts away out of visual range. Cyclops then, in turn, uses his near-perfect aim and concussive eye beam to bounce Momsel Hepzibab back towards the Starjammer. While this is happening, Colossus has a setback in his recovery and lost consciousness. Apparently his chest wound opened up again due to not taking the rest he was advised to take. Now he needs certain now he needs surgery all over again, which will be performed by Sikorsky, being held by Storm. All the X-Men are asked to leave and Wolverine makes an issue out of this, but is still being picked up and dropped outside of the infirmary by Sikorsky himself. Being tired of having to wait and not being able to help Pyotr, or Earth itself, frustrates Wolverine. Charles and Scott try to calm Wolverine down, while they are surprised by a hologram popping up, telling them to come to the bridge. Once at the bridge, they meet up with Lelandra, who informs them of her trying to establish communications with Chancellor Araki, who is orbiting Earth at the moment and acknowledged contact at first, but has thus far not responded any further. 
When we switch over to Iraqi's cabin, we see the reason why, namely that it's been shot by the traitor Admiral Samadar. Worried by what could have happened to Iraqi and with the star jammer not being fully repaired, Cyclops and Xavier decide to telepathically contact Kurt and Kitty, who were still hostages aboard the Shi'ar vessel. Normally this would have been quite the effort over such a distance, but in this case, Xavier is confronted with a disturbance within himself. He senses something alien and tries to contact it, instead of continuing the mind lick with Kurt and Kitty. This turns out to be a wrong choice since it renders him almost comatose. We then leave the X-Men and Star Jammers and switch over to the Bruce living spaceship, which is wounded by the Star Jammers' escape through its body. There's a tussle between the Brute and their ally Deathbird, seeing as they both blame the other for the reason set back in their mutual plans. Both parties come to the realization that a battle between them would serve neither well. Deathbird demands to know why the Brute attacked her, and the Brute explain why. Deathbird then reveals how she scanned their mutual enemy and found that they are mutants with extraordinary capabilities when compared to baseline humans. This immediately triggers the Brute's interest as they would make exceptional hosts. A new alliance is forged between the two parties. We then switch over to the Shi'ar's fleet orbiting Earth and more specifically to Nightcrawler and Kitty. Kitty, donning yet again another newly created costume, explains to Kurt how she's been using the costume creating device to tap into the Shi'ar mainframe and prime computer. She asks Kurt how he can be so calm after everything that's happened. Klaus is apparently being killed, the mind link with Professor X cut off, and then being unable to establish contact with Chancellor Araki to tell him Lelandra is alright. She says that they have to do something. Kurt then responds that he is doing something, namely rigging a portable computer with the data that Kitty has been able to swipe from the Shi'ar computer systems. They then notice that the ship they're in is being called to battle stations and they figure the deadline is up and the Shi'ar are about to launch an attack on planet Earth. Kitty makes a new costume which allows her to cling to the spaceship's exterior walls and uses her phasing powers to escape through the walls. She is once again amazed at the views she has in outer space and thinks to herself how she's not just an X-Men like she had just told Kurt seconds before, but also just a kid and how nervous she is for what she's about to do. Her lungs are starting to ache, since she's been holding her breath to be able to make the spacewalk, looking for an emergency lock which will grant her access to the rest of the ship beyond her holding cell. She gains entry back in the ship as planned, and thanks to Professor X's info dump knows exactly where she is in the ship and where she needs to go. She makes her way to the holding cell in which Kurt and her were being held captive, and eavesdrops on three Shiard guards planning to open the door and spraying the insides with blasts of fire, because Admiral Samadar wants both of them dead. As they open the door, Kitty faces through the guards to warn Nightcrawler just in time, who then uses his teleportation power to quickly take out the guards. Kitty and Kurt then continue with their plan. Kurt has a minigun and a programmed miniature version of the costume maker Kitty had been using. Kitty asks if their crazy plan will work. Kurt responds by saying that there's only one way to find out, and they make their way to find Chancellor Araki. When they find him, they see him lying dead on the floor. They immediately assume the assassination was ordered by Samadar. They needed a rocky for their plan, so they changed their plan and Kurt suggests that the Imperial Guard, who should be loyal to Empress Lelandra, is their next best bet, and specifically their telepath Oracle. We then switch to the bridge where we see Samadar giving orders to target missiles at the major population centers on Earth. The captain inquires if he's misunderstanding the orders, and if Chancellor Araki should not be present for this action. At that moment, the crew is startled by explosions and smoke everywhere, and the sudden appearance of the Phoenix. As one of the greatest dangers to the Shi'ar Empire, she threatens the Shi'ar not to attack Earth with it being her home. One more explosion and the Phoenix is gone, as we see her slipping through a half dozen decks. The gladiator of the Imperial Guard asks Oracle to mind scan the ship and its surroundings in space, to make sure the Phoenix, or whatever it was, is no longer there. As he asks her again to hurry up, she disappears in the same kind of explosion. We then see Nightcrawler on the floor, dizzy from all the teleporting he's been doing, especially bringing Oracle with him, since bringing people along always takes more out of him. Oracle has no idea what's going on in this moment, and Kurt tells her to calm down, and that they mean no harm. Kitty then enters, facing through a wall and still wearing the Phoenix costume, scaring Oracle, who tries to run away but is too much out of him. 
so much so that she can't even heal the rest of the Imperial Guard telepathically to come help her. Kitty snatches her immediately. Kitty and Kurt are able to calm down Oracle and persuade her by telling her the whole truth about Alandra, Samadar and Araki. They then in turn tell the whole story to Gladiator, Starbolt and the rest of the Imperial Guard. Starbolt is being a skeptic, but Oracle and Gladiator convince him. They then get interrupted by Samadar, who was onto their conspiring against him. He sends his own followers of the Imperial Guard to find and attack Gladiator's team. A chaotic battle ensues, and Nightcrawler asks Kitty what she thinks she's doing. She says she wants help, because she can fight as well, but Kurt tells her to find a way to the central core and disable the ship by rigging the computers and put a stop to Samadar's plan to launch an attack on Earth. Kid is almost being captured by Webwing, but manages to escape by facing through the floor. As Nightcrawler and Gladiator's team start to win the battle, Samadar detonates a brute weapon which he had attached to Warstar. The weapon disables everyone close to Warstar. In the meantime, Kitty is disrupting the computers aboard the Shi'ar spaceship by facing through them, which has a disabling effect on electronic devices. Lost in thought about how she would love to wring Deathbird's neck for what she did to Colossus, she gets shot. While Samadar and Gladiator argue, Samadar orders a shot aimed at Earth. This shot gets intercepted and absorbed by the Starjammer, being piloted in between the Shi'ar vessel and Earth. A holographic display of Lelandra is sent to every Shi'ar ship in the fleet, ordering all ships to stand down. She asks Gladiator why the attack was ordered, why he's taken captive, and where Chancellor Araki is. Gladiator responds by saying Araki is slain by Samadar, who is in league with Deathbird. Lelandra orders the guards to place Samadar under arrest, free Gladiator, the loyal Imperial Guard members, and the X-Men, and for the fleet to retreat beyond Earth's moon. After the broadcast ends, Lelandra, Cyclops and Corsair discuss on the press, discuss on the past threats and the current ones specifically Deathbird and her allegiance with the Brood, who are fairly unknown to them all. Cyclops welcomes Colossus back, who seems to have mostly healed, and Pyotr responds by saying he wishes the same could be said about Professor X. Xavier seems physically fine, but his mind might have been destroyed by the recent mental attack. Issue 158 This issue starts off in the Bermuda Triangle, more specifically Magneto's former base, currently the home of the X-Men after the Xavier Mansion got destroyed. We see Carol Danvers, the former Avenger Miss Marvel, in a hand-to-hand -hand combat exercise with three star jammers, Mamsel Hepzibah, Raza and Chode. Chode is accompanied by his pet Curie. The exercise is being monitored by Peter Corbeau, an associate of the X-Men. The battle surprisingly goes back and forth, considering Carol is pretty much a baseline human being now after having lost her powers. Eventually the three star gemmers win the battle. We then see Colossus and his sister Ilyana are watching TV in another part of the base. Kitty is there too, but she's lost in thoughts. She thinks about Colossus and how he seems to be recovering well. She also thinks about how short she's been with the X-Men, but already has experienced so much. Fights with aliens, demons and supervillains, how she's seen people die and almost died herself. She thinks how she should probably go back to living a normal life, but also how none of them are really normal. She also wonders if they do not only have special powers, but also special feelings. She recalls how she felt when she thought Colossus died, and how she felt when she found out when he apparently hadn't died. Feelings she has not felt before as a 14 year old kid. Feelings that won't go away. She feels she has to talk to someone, but who? Xavier is sick and she feels like she can't confide in any of the guys, which only leaves Storm. We then switch back to the section of the island where Carol was being studied by Peter Corbeau, with the help of the Star Jammers. We find out that after Carol lost her powers, her body is apparently still changed, transformed beyond that of a normal human body. Maura McTaggart, a close friend of Charles Xavier and a scientist and geneticist, is also there. We find out that Charles is doing alright physically. Nightcrawler teleports in to tell Maura to come to the improvised sickbay to meet up with Lelandra. There we also find Charles, comatose, 
Storm, Wolverine, Lelandra, and Oracle of the Imperial Guard. Oracle, being a telepath, might just be the only one that can possibly help. In full concentration, she enters Charles' mind. What she finds herself in is a psychic riptide of chaos and she experiences a conflict in which she feels like she died and undergoes a thousand gruesome deaths. She becomes more and more in sync with Xavier and screams a shriek of pain and terror. She finds hunger, something alien, an insatiable predator, a foul and evil presence, and when she sees it, she denies and forgets it. Xavier in his mind notices this and sobs in frustration and despair, while something in his very soul starts grinning. Oracle then gets mentally taken over by Professor X, and their combined psi energy powers are trying to destroy everything in their surroundings. Mora notices this and concludes Xavier is trying to commit suicide due to his utter hopelessness by destroying the sick bay and everyone in it. She tells Wolverine to use his claws to sever the energy link between Charles and Oracle. Storm uses her power to hurl Wolverine between Charles and Oracle, so he can use his unbreakable adamantium claws to sever the energy link. Nightcrawler and Storm extinguish the fire in the sick bay. Lelandra sits herself next to Charles on his bed and thinks on how she's less of a person without him around. Mora looks after Oracle, but she tells her that she's fine, but Xavier is not, and how he's retreated deep within his own mind, fighting a battle against himself, apparently. While the X-Men inside the sickbay keep extinguishing the fires, Kitty faces through the walls, asking what had happened. Kurt tells her what happened, and also tells her to be careful with randomly popping in, because the fires are still burning, and many of the electrical systems are still working, which might get destroyed by her phasing powers. Kitty tells everyone about an item on the TV about the X-Men. It's a talk show, and there are scenes shown of the X-Men's battles with the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants and with Deathbird from days before. They are portrayed as one of the most mysterious superhero groups, as opposed to the Avengers and the Fantastic Four, who are more well known. The guest of today on the talk show is United States Senator Robert Kelly, who immediately takes issue with the X-Men being called heroes. He classifies them as outlaws. Kurt can't believe this and talks about how they could not have acted differently since they were being attacked and asks himself if they should have let themselves and innocent bystanders get killed in the attacks. Wolverine says it's useless because this guy won't change his mind. His mind is made up. The talk show host reminds Senator Kelly how the X-Men fought recognized criminals and how they saved Kelly's life in an assassination attempt carried out by the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. Kelly says that that doesn't matter. It's more about the principle of taking the law in their own hands and that there are more and more so-called superheroes popping up every day in the United States but also globally and that if national security is at stake these mutants need to be investigated, examined and if they are a threat they must get dealt with. Of course this comes to a shock to the X-Men and Kitty wonders why this man hates them so. Wolverine responds by saying the nature of the beast kiddo to fear which is different. Mora, being a longtime friend and confidant of Charles, tells the rest of the X-Men that he worked together with the government when he formed the original X-Men team, and how the government has files on each and every one of them, and probably the current team as well. She says that they've been safe and lucky so far, but this political and social shift might change all that, and that these files will have to be destroyed. Kitty being a whisket suggests to create a virus program to search and erase all references about the X-Men, and have that infect the central data bank. Storm asks if she can do that, and Kitty responds that the Starjammers can. We then see the Starjammer spaceship land on the ground in Rio Diablo, next to the house of former X-Men and Havocan Polaris, preparing dinner. Alex opens the door and finds Scott, his brother, was knocking on it. Alex invites Scott in, and Scott tells him he's not alone, and that he has a bomb to drop, namely that he brought his long-lost father along, Christopher Summers, also known as Corsair, the leader of the Starjammers. Alex, being shocked at first, invites them in and they have a long, long conversation with the four of them. In the meantime, a car pulls up outside of the Pentagon. Wolverine and Carol step outside of the car and wear their military uniforms. One of the Canadian Armed Forces, the other of the United States Air Force. They are accompanied by Storm who comes along with Carol and Wolverine, and by Nightcrawler as a chauffeur. When they enter, military personnel tells Wolverine how they are getting exceptionally strong readings from the metal detectors. Which makes sense, since his full skeleton has adamantium lacing. Storm in her mind gets worried and hopes for Wolverine to have a grip on his short temper. Carol tells the lieutenant that they don't have time for this, 
and Wolverine whips out his medic card which shows that he has prosthetic metal implants all over due to war wounds. They proceed and Wolverine and Carol have a little talk about their ranks and whether they are real and earned. They make their way to the Special Intelligence Service Operation Vault, the most highly guarded area of the entire Pentagon. Carol's high rank would be useful in getting there. While Carol gives a short history on the Pentagon and Wolverine and her joke around a little bit, Carol bumps into an old familiar person. Not entirely one she expected, and not even a friendly one at that. It appears to be Rogue, the one person who attacked her months before when Carol was still Miss Marvel, and used her memory absorbing powers to temporarily steal Carol's powers. Carol fought hard against it, the struggle took too long and something went wrong. The transfer became permanent and caused a lot of damage, in both women. Rogue punches Carol and knocks her on the floor. Wolverine attacks Rogue, recognizing her as one of the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, and during their fight, Rogue absorbs Wolverine's powers, rendering Wolverine unconscious. Storm immediately fires a warning shot at Rogue and tells her to leave. Rogue tells her that she was actually looking forward to meeting the X-Men and tearing them apart. Carol grabs the soldier's gun and fires at Rogue, but to no avail. The bullets bounce off of Rogue like they would on herself when she still had those same powers. Storm uses her elemental powers to push Rogue away to a place where they have more room for a fight and generates a fog in the corridor while finding eye contact with Carol. She knows she hates Rogue and with good reason, but they have a job to do. When the fog clears, Rogue, Wolverine and Storm are gone and Carol continues on her way to the data center. While she's lost in thought about how Rogue stole everything from her, She's being spied on by another figure, who picks up a handgun from the floor and follows her. It is apparently Raven Darkholm, also known as Mystique, the leader of the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, in her civilian form. Storm, while carrying a still unconscious Wolverine, wonders if Rogue was alone, or if they had stumbled on an assault operation by the Brotherhood by accident. She thinks to herself how Rogue seemed way too casual and relaxed, and wonders if the government and the Brotherhood might be working together. At that moment, Rogue smashes through a wall, bashing Storm, who drops Wolverine. Rogue boasts how Wolverine's enhanced senses are a nice skill to have. Storm then uses her communicator to ask Nightcrawler for help, who teleports to the location and tries to deal with Rogue. A fight between the three X-Men and Rogue continues. In the meantime, Carol has gotten access to the data center, and Mystique, who is still on her trail, shapeshifts into Nick Fury, the director of S.H.I.E.L.D. During the fight between Rogue and the X-Men, Rogue gets hold of Storm and absorbs her powers. Now these powers are way too much for Rogue to immediately get a grip on. It took Storm a long time to get them fully under control. Nightcrawler tries to rescue his teammates, but Rogue is creating a flash flood. In the data center, Mystique, posing as Nick Fury, holds Carol at gunpoint and shoots her right after she startled Carol. The X-Men team up on Rogue and are almost able to capture her, but she breaks free regardless. Mystique approaches Carol, who is apparently playing possum, and kicks Mystique, who she still thinks is Nick Fury, while saying looks can be deceiving, which is ironic of course. Carol is able to dodge the bullet and it only grazes her, as she wonders why Nick wouldn't shoot her. When Carol punches him, he shapeshifts into Storm, which of course catches Carol off guard, but she's still able to overpower her and render her unconscious at which moment Mystique refers back to her natural form. She figures out it was Mystique, the person that sent Rogue after her to steal her powers to begin with, and she now plans on killing Mystique. The X-Men seem to not be able to beat Rogue, so Storm creates a whirlwind and hurls Rogue miles away. And she suggests the X-Men to leave the Pentagon and abort the mission, since it's now crowded with security forces and they're beat from their fight with Rogue. What they don't know is that Carol has handed over Mystique to the military police. Mystique issues a threat and Carol tells the police to take her away and that she'll secure the vault. Carol thinks about how she probably should have killed Mystique, because with her shape-shifting power she is most likely bound to escape and come after Carol in the future. She can't recall why Mystique hates her so much, since that part of her memories are gone due to Rogue's attack. She comes across her own data file while she's unleashing the computer virus in the data banks and can't even recall any of the history written about her in those files. The faces are familiar, but those women are strangers to her. She raises the files on her and figures it's time to stop clinging to the person she was or could have been and needs to accept her fate in the here and now. 
While she's walking outside, she wonders how the government will explain this attack on the Pentagon and how the X-Men will probably get the blame for everything, especially with Senator Kelly firing up the flames of anti-mutant paranoia. And since the X-Men are not a sanctioned superhero group, unlike the Avengers, they will not be able to tell their side of the story to clear things up. She gets picked up by Kurt and enters the car and meets back up with Storm and Wolverine. They exchange the success and failures of the mission and consider the fact that Carol was able to erase all the data files concerning the X-Men as a great success. Carol agrees and is excited to start the rest of her new life. Issue 159 When this issue starts, the X-Men enter an apartment that belongs to the private investigator Missy Knight, who is a friend of the team. Instead of Misty, they find another person there who they don't recognize, apart from Kitty, namely Harmony Young, who apparently is a top fashion model in New York. The X-Men introduce themselves and Harmony explains how she's the roommate of Misty and says the X-Men are welcome and says something flirtatious to the guys, while Wolverine goes looking for a beer. Kitty seems somewhat displeased with Harmony calling Colossus cute. Wolverine reminds Kitty on how she has an appointment with her parents and Kitty seemingly forgot about it. She asks Storm if she will come along, but having no fitting outfit, Harmony helps him out with the wardrobe. When the girls are all dressed up, they head out and look for a taxi. It seems like a foggy evening. Next we take a look at a conversation between Scott and Alex. They talk about all the things that have happened recently, about Professor X's estate and about the reunion with her father, who they hadn't seen since they were little kids. After playing around with their powers a bit, they head back inside to join Corsair and Polaris. They talk about Corsair's plans and whether he will stay on Earth now, or, or go back to being a space pirate, and whether Scott and Alex should join him. Corsair says he doesn't know. Back in Greenwich Village, we see Nightcrawler talking to Harmony about how he was in a circus in a past life. Kitty calls on the phone and says that she is doing alright at her parents' place. She asks to speak to Storm, but Storm hasn't returned yet. This worries Kurt, since Kitty says how she left hours ago and was supposed to go straight back to the apartment. We then see Storm lying on the floor, with a stream of blood coming from her throat. She gets rushed into a hospital and the personnel try and save her life. The police are able to inform the other X-Men by making a phone call to a New York address, which they found in the victim's wallet. When they arrive, they meet up with Dr. O'Hara, and she tells them the police think she was attacked, yet not robbed, nor molested. She also tells them that Aurora seemingly recovered fast, and that the damage done seemed far worse than it actually was. Just some blood loss, but nothing major. They had considered a blood transfusion, but weren't able to match the blood type. The test came out with a result the doctor had not seen before. Logan worries about the doctors poking about with their tests and figuring out that she's a mutant, which would blow their cover. They enter Storm's room and see her up and about already. Storm wants to leave, the doctor asks her to stay, just to be sure. Storm thinks to herself how staying longer jeopardizes the X-Men secrets, but she also feels strangely safe in the hospital. She's surprised to find that she's somewhat scared of the night while she looks outside through one of the windows and thinks she sees eyes staring at her. She waves it off as just being in her imagination. When they get back to Missy's apartment, she gets put to bed by Peter, Logan and Kurt and she tells them to stop mothering her. Kurt tells her to get some sleep and that they'll be right outside if she needs them. She tries to fall asleep but it doesn't work. She keeps tossing and turning and she starts hearing things. It seems there's a fog entering the room. Her senses are becoming unbearably acute. She hears a voice calling to her but tries to ignore it. She starts sweating and feels as if she's dreaming. She rises from her bed and opens a window and tells something to come inside. The fog surrounds her and Storm enjoys the feeling. At the end of Sunday afternoon, Kitty returns from her stay at her parents. She sees the three some overt faces and asks where Storm is. The guys tell her Aurora got attacked on Friday night and that she's not doing well. They thought she was, but apparently had a setback in her recovery. They don't know what's going on with her, and she won't allow them to call a doctor or take her back to the hospital. Logan tells Kitty that Storm does not seem to want to go on there. 
Kitty races to Missy's room where Storm is and opens the curtains to let some light in through the window. Storm yells to Kitty to close them again because the daylight is hurting her. Kitty looks at Aurora and she looks horrible, weak, pale and old. Kitty starts a conversation with Storm and comments on her nice scarf. Storm says she got it from an admirer, but she also wonders how that can be, since he's but a figment of her imagination, a phantom who haunts her dreams. There's a capital letter D on the scarf. Storm flinches when some light is reflected off of Kitty's Star of David necklace. Kitty starts wondering if she's being ridiculously superstitious, or if there's really a connection between the aversion to sunlight, to religious artifacts, anemia, and the dream she's been having. Kitty tries to approach Storm, but Storm slaps her away and tells her to leave her be. Kitty then faces to the next room and has a quick interaction with Logan before she leaves the apartment. The next night, Storm has one more of her supposed dreams. There is once again a fog and the fog almost seems alive. Storm gets up out of bed and opens the window yet again to let her secret lover in. He courts her and Aurora is susceptible to this. The Prince of Darkness has found a new bride and he wants her blood, soul and life. At that moment, Kitty faces through the wall holding a cross in her hands. She apparently had figured out that there was something going on of this caliber. Dracula jumps at first sight but notices how it has no effect. It's because Kitty is not a Christian, but of the Hebrew faith. Being Jewish makes that the cross as a religious symbol carries no power because her beliefs are not in line with the religious artifacts she's holding. Dracula attacks Kitty and grabs her by the neck. Luckily, the silver star of David necklace around her neck burns his hand. Kitty tries to convince Storm to leave with her, now that Dracula is distracted, but Storm hits Kitty in the face. None may harm her lord, and she and Dracula both fly out of the window, with Storm telling Kitty to forget about her and to not try and follow her and save her, or she will meet with an early death. The rest of the X-Men come barging in because they heard a fight and ask Kitty where Aurora is. She explains what had happened and how she did not tell them because she wasn't sure if that was what was really going on. But she shows them the scarf with a capital letter D on it. Wolverine dismisses it, saying it probably belongs to Misty or Harmony. But Kurt tells Wolverine to take Kitty more seriously and that Kurt does believe it because where he comes from, in Bavaria, Germany, they have had more experiences with vampires and Dracula in particular. Kitty says they have to find Storm and help her before it's too late and Wolverine is up for the task. A couple hours later and thinks of Wolverine's hide and senses, the trail ends in Central Park, New York, at the Belvedere Castle. They get attacked by Dracula and several creatures, and Kurt jumps towards Dracula, but he gets easily dealt with. Colossus and Wolverine deal with the creatures while they try and protect Nightcrawler. Colossus and Wolverine perform an attack they call the Fastball Special, as Colossus throws Wolverine at their enemy. Dracula transforms into a mist, and Wolverine misses his target and lands right in front of the dogs that came with Dracula. Colossus goes head to head with Dracula, but gets thrown through the woods by him. Wolverine and Nightcrawler agree they can't beat Dracula with raw power and come up with another tactic. Wolverine says he's seen the movies and makes a cross with his adamantium claws. Dracula responds by saying what he said to Kitty, that it has no merit if you're not a true believer. Luckily Kurt is a devout Catholic and he's making a cross out of wood and sticks. This does have an effect and Dracula summons lightning bolts out of the sky and keeps attacking Nightcrawler, who tries to keep away from the attacks by teleporting. Something he can do for a while, but not endlessly. In the meantime we follow Kitty who has made her entrance in the castle, looking for Storm. She has no idea where to go, so she just walks around and sees where it will lead her. She thinks to herself how huge the place is and how it gives her the creeps. She stumbles into a room and sees a coffin there. She wonders if it's Storm's coffin or Dracula's coffin. She sneaks closer and is ready to open the lid, with a wooden stake in her hands. When she opens it, it appears to be empty. She pours holy water inside and she hopes it's Dracula's coffin. At that moment Kitty gets struck, and as a reflex she faces, too late, and ends up half in a wall. She sees it's Storm, but a change Storm. Eyes red, teeth fanged, and she wonders how that's possible, since she has not had the time to get raised from the grave three days after she had died. She concludes that the transformation has begun, while she's still alive and that it's warping Storm's mind. Storm tells Kitty that she shouldn't resist, because the change she's experiencing is quite beautiful. She faces through Storm and reaches for the wooden stake she was holding in her hands before. 
Aurora says that with her powers, Kitty is no match for her. Kitty tries to convince Storm to fight Dracula's influence, since she told her she was a goddess consecrated to life. She pleads to fight Dracula with all her heart and soul. Kitty drops a stake and calls Aurora's bluff and tells her to take her life then if she wants it so badly. The X-Men, still fighting with Dracula, have not gotten any further in winning the battle. Kurt returns after having teleported all around Central Park, trying to escape Dracula's lightning bolt attacks. He tries to trick Dracula in hitting himself with one of his own bolts, but all he did was hit the X-Men and Dracula is still standing strong. Storm approaches and asks Dracula what he will do with the X-Men. He tells her that he will slay them. Aurora then attacks Dracula. Apparently the control he had over her has been somewhat broken. She chases him in the air and smashes him inside a restaurant 50 stories high. Dracula commands her to bare her neck and even though there's still a remainder of his hold he had over her, she's able to resist. She picks up a broken table leg and plans on using it as a stake while Dracula comments on how she's been able to resist him twice now. He grabs one of the guests of the restaurant and threatens to rip her throat out if Storm doesn't yield. Storm surrenders, but not entirely. She demands Dracula to free the woman and she tells him that she will destroy him, no matter how long it takes, and also that no innocent blood will get spilled because of her. She says that he may transform her into a vampire, even slay her, but he will never own her. She was born free and will remain so. Dracula acknowledges how, when he tasted her blood, that she is a woman of rare strength, courage and beauty, and how those qualities attracted him to her and have now defeated him. He leaves the scene, saying how when he was alive he was a prince, and that she is one of the few women he has ever met worthy of being his queen. And how apparently he cannot force his will on her, how she has earned his respect and thus her life. Storm tells him that he will not escape that easily, and Dracula responds by saying that she shouldn't push her luck that there's no use in chasing him because the world is vast and she will never find a trace of him, no matter how hard she tries. And when next time they meet, it will be at a time and place of his choosing. When the sun rises and the X-Men gather themselves, Kitty notices how Storm is doing fine in direct sunlight and apparently the vampire infection must be gone. Storm and Kitty hug, telling one another how scared they were. They shed tears and Storm thanks Kitty for what she did and Storm is in debt to her, beyond human payment. When they make their way downstairs, they are greeted by Harmony, Misty and Misty's best friend Colleen Wing. They share some drinks and Storm retells exactly what had happened, albeit reluctantly. They receive a phone call and the person on the other end is asking for Storm. It's Moira, telling the X-Men to hurry and return to the island as soon as possible and for them to pick up Cyclops on the way home. Professor X has taken a turn for the worse. Issue 160. This issue opens up with a page where we see a figure with jewelry and long nails lurking through some kind of screen, watching Storm fighting her fellow X-Men with Ilyana watching. After observing them for a bit, he finds out that they're not really fighting, but they're in an exercise to hone their abilities. We find out that the shadow figure had been looking around for Ilyana. He lures her and tells her to tell no one. He's telling her she has a grand and glorious destiny in front of her and for her to follow his voice to paradise. Kitty notices Ilyana slipping away while they're in the middle of their exercise and yells out in Russian to come back. The former base of Magneto they've made their home is still somewhat of a mystery to them since they haven't been there for that long, but Ilyana seems to know exactly where to go. Kitty is amazed at how fast Ilyana is and she loses track of her. While she's lost in thought, thinking about how this place gives her the creeps and how she should get the others, she steps into a light circle on the floor. She can't move and disappears while she screams out for help. The X-Men are done with their exercise and Wolverine wants a beer. Colossus says that he'd prefer some iced tea and Nightcrawler asks Storm if she's doing alright. She responds by saying that she's just tired, but she'll recover. Kurt says she's pushing herself so hard since it's been barely a day after that battle with Dracula. He suggests that she should take a shower and she says that's a good idea. 
She thinks to herself how Kurt is right, that she should take it more easy, and how she's still somewhat under the influence of what had happened to her because of her interaction with Dracula. She tries to conjure up a rainstorm, Storm's preferred way of taking a shower, but lacks the concentration due to her thoughts about Dracula, the Professor and Scott, who seems to not respond to their summons. Eventually she gets it done and asks if the others want to join her in the rain. Wolverine says it's a good idea and Colossus asks if anyone has seen his little sister. Wolverine says he did and that Kitty said something about following her, but that was a while ago. Kurt once again mentions how he dislikes the place and Storm takes notice of this. She tells Wolverine to scout the area and see if he can find the girls and tells Kurt and Pyotr to go along with him. Wolverine easily tracks him to the temple Kitty followed Iliana in and Wolverine asks if anyone has ever been here before. No one has and Storm notices how it's totally dark apart from flashing circles of light. She yells out for Kitty and Iliana, but Wolverine tells her it's no use since his senses tell him it's been a while since the girls were here and that they are now the only ones there. At that moment they get surprised by those flashing circles of light appearing underneath them and they disappear. We see Kitty picking herself up from the floor wherever she is and we see a figure appearing behind her. She looks around and is amazed yet disgusted by the surroundings. As she shouts out for Ilyana, we see Nightcrawler asking her if she's looking for someone. This scares Kitty at first, but she gives him a hug, telling him how glad she is to see him. Kitty then yells out, asking Kurt how he dares touching her like that. And she faces with Kurt's hand passing through her chest. Kurt responds by saying that he was merely giving her the opportunity to prove how glad she was to see him. We then see how this Kurt is not the Kurt Kitty is used to. Kitty runs away and tries to convince herself that this isn't real. She trips over something lying on the floor and falls right in front of the figure who introduces himself as Belasco. We then see Colossus and Storm, who apparently have ended up together, exploring the hallways of the place they were transported to. They are not sure if they're still on the island or not. Pyotr wonders if this is an accident or if his little sister had been abducted. Colossus finds an armlet and gives it to Storm, who examines it. It's made of pure silver and carved with intricate runes. She's never seen it before, yet it feels strangely familiar. She clings it onto her upper arm and tells Colossus that she wished she had answers for him. Colossus tells her he's terribly afraid for his little sister, and she tells him not to despair and that they will bring Eliana home, safe and sound. Storm gets attacked at the moment by something that seems to only consist of tentacles. It feels like it's tearing her apart, and the monster skin exudes some kind of acid that burns through her costume and also her skin. She yells out to Colossus, who then tries to rescue her, but he steps on one of those circles of light and disappears. Storm sees this and figures she's as good as dead, but notices how her body seems to be transforming into a mixture of her teammates' features. Colossus' metal skin keeps her safe from the acid, Wolverine's claws cut her free, Nightcrawler's agility moves her out of harm's way, while her own powers sweep her to safety. In the next scene, we see Belasco and the distorted Nightcrawler holding Kitty and Eliana captive. Kitty has been put in some kind of crystal that keeps her from using her powers. Kitty sees Nightcrawler, asking Eliana if she wants to play with him, and Belasco shoots at him with some kind of blast. He tells him he needs to be gone and to know his place, as Belasco's servant. Belasco then assures Kitty that this is indeed the Nightcrawler she knows, yet reshaped in the image of his true Lord Belasco. He introduces himself further as the chief disciple of the Elder Ones, Elder Gods who seek to invade and conquer this plane of reality. He also retells how he tried opening the gateway between both dimensions before, but was defeated and as a punishment was banished to the interdimensional limbo. He tells Kitty that he plans on using her and Eliana as a means to both liberate himself from his imprisonment, but also to have the Dark Ones triumph. But before all this, he needs to ensure that Kitty's fellow X-Men meet the end they deserve. He summons his henchman Sim, right next to the body Kitty had tripped over earlier. Sim asks Velasco what had happened to the midget, because last Sim saw him, he still had meat covering his adamantium bones. He mentions how he thinks it's too bad, since he wanted to kill Wolverine himself. He then breaks off one of Wolverine's claws and uses it as a toothpick and asks Belasco what he wants, who he wants killed. Belasco responds by telling Sim how he should be ashamed of himself 
and asks him how he has no respect for the dead. He then asks Kitty if the sight of Wolverine's dead body distresses her and asks her if she wants to take a good look for herself. He casts a spell towards Kitty, who can only scream on the inside, and pulls out Kitty's skeleton from her trapped physical body. He has her skeleton stand in front of her and wave at her, just to sadistically make fun of her. He then tells her that the Eldritch Crystal and his magics are the only reason she's still alive to experience this traumatizing event. He then gives Ileana a necklace, as a token of his love, and tells her that once she's grown into a woman and learned the arcane arts, and all five bloodstones are in place in the necklace, she will ascend to the glorious destiny as promised before. All this is being watched by Nightcrawler, the real one, as he wonders how all this is possible, seeing his doppelganger Wolverine reduced to bones, Kitty imprisoned, and Ileana's apparent sacrifice, and whether he's fallen headlong into hell. He also wonders what has happened to Storm and Colossus, and swears that it doesn't matter because his friends will be avenged. On the next page we see Storm wake up, as if from a nightmare. She remembers what had happened before and is surprised to find her body is restored to its normal self and asks herself what could have been responsible for the changes. She takes a look at the surroundings she woke up in and concludes it's a beautiful yet hauntingly familiar place. Just like the armlet Pyotr found, she wonders if he's doing alright. Having woken up naked, she wants to take a dive in the pool right there before she wants to put her clothes on. When she lifts herself up out of the water, she introduces herself and asks if someone is around. She finds out her costume is ruined from the creature's attack and finds a pair of other clothes, including an amulet, in a cabinet and figures her savior is a woman and she puts it on. Thinking about how right it feels around her body, she wonders if her savior meant for her to have it, along with the amulet as some kind of weapon. She thanks the person as if it is a friend and leaves. We then see a shrouded figure thinking to itself how they will meet again and how she will help save the X-Men, but if it takes her to sacrifice them to destroy Belasco, she will. In the next panel, we see the evil Nightcrawler being shouted at by the Kurt we know, telling him to face him. While they attack one another, the evil Kurt retells what had happened to him. How he came here to save Ilyana and Kitty, and how he saw his friends get slaughtered, how he was wounded himself near death, and Belasco spared him, healed him and showed him the glory of evil. During their fight, which is being fought with primordial brutality, they teleport away, both at the same time. We then see Blasco scolding Nightcrawler that he did not summon him. But Nightcrawler tells him that he brings news to his lord. How he was attacked by an X-Man, he killed him and asked if he did not serve his master well. Blasco tells him he probably did, but issues a threat to the demon to be careful because Blasco already possesses his soul and if he tempts fate again, he'll have his heart as well. Next we follow Wolverine making his way through the tunnels. He's finding trails of his friends, but they are incredibly old and it doesn't make sense to him. He runs into the corpse of his friend Colossus hanging on the wall. Colossus just escaped in, but his remains look ancient to Logan. Colossus' looks, his face and his hair tell Wolverine that Colossus was an old man when he died here. But it certainly is his friend Pyotr hanging there, not a fake or a trick. Wolverine wonders how this can be as he's being attacked, grabbed by a huge hand. It's Sim's hand and he rips Wolverine's shirt off while he smashes him into the walls. He tells Wolverine that Colossus hanging there is his handiwork and how he's heard Wolverine himself is a pretty little rough and tough one. Sim slams Wolverine at the back of his head as he tries to attack Sim and is about to stomp on him when a teleportation circle appears and teleports Wolverine away, just in time. Sim comments on how those things are annoying and how they appear out of nowhere and transport bodies through time and space, how Wolverine could now practically be anywhere and at any time. Sim is then approached by someone from behind. It's the Colossus we know telling Sim to yield or suffer the consequences. Sim tells Colossus his bluff won't win him in the battle and he takes the adamantium claw of Wolverine's corpse, which he had been using as a toothpick, out of his pants and throws it at Colossus. It pierces right through Colossus's organic steel skin. They end up in a hand-to-hand -hand combat, in which Colossus seems to get overpowered by Sim's speed and brute strength. Colossus has to try and find a way to use Sim's strength against him, just like Cyclops had trained him to. But Sim tightens his grip around Colossus's head and neck. He lifts Colossus up in the air, and as he does, he gets stabbed in the rear end, by Wolverine, who seems to have returned. 
Wolverine does what he does best and starts hacking and slashing into Sim. But it hardly hurts or damages Sim and he picks Logan up in the air by his limbs. He then gets kicked from behind in the back by Colossus, right into one of those light circles on the floor. Wolverine and Colossus are happy they found one another and Wolverine tells Pyotr that it wasn't luck, but the magic of a woman who brought him back to where Colossus and Sim were. Logan and the woman both think about how he's recognized her. She uses her magic and another teleportation circle appears underneath Colossus and Wolverine and they get teleported right in front of Belasco and his pet Nightcrawler and Kitty trapped inside the crystal with the skeleton next to her. The skeleton waves at Pyotr and Logan. Belasco greets them and tells them he has met them now for the first and final time. Nightcrawler then attacks Belasco. Apparently it was the good Kurt, posing as the evil one. Storm who has just arrived attacks as well with the lightning bolt and Belasco acknowledges that they have him at a disadvantage right now and he retreats. Kurt tells the other X-Men and all that he has seen and what Kitty's status is. Storm, being disgusted with this, is about to lift herself up with wind controlling powers to chase Belasco to make him pay for what he's done. Surprisingly the wind turns and stops her in mid-flight. This is being done by the shrouded woman who had been helping them from the shadows. She tells Storm to not pursue Belasco because she has been there, making that same decision in the past, and how her friends the rest of the X-Men followed her and they died. How that choice in the past had damned her, and how she will not allow that to happen again. Kurt analyzes the situation about how Belasco told him they were in a magical limbo where none of the rules of time and space apply. How they can be both old and young, alive and dead, good and evil, as they have all experienced in the past couple of hours. Aurora then tells Kurt to spare her the philosophical talk and help her find a way to save Kitty instead. The older version of Storm chimes in, saying how she thinks he can be of assistance. As she grew older and her ability to control the elements started dwindling, she turned to her other elf, namely Sorcery. Belasco had allowed this because he figured Storm's study of the Black Arts would corrupt her, just like they had Nightcrawler. The other Storm starts using her magic to merge both Kitty's skeleton with the rest of her body and soul, which are trapped inside the crystal. A process which will be painful to Kitty, and she releases her from her entrapment. Kitty thanks Storm for saving her, and she's shocked to find out how old she is. She does not understand this. At this time, Sim appears from another light circle, and Wolverine deals with him properly this time around, in mere seconds. He says that they better leave because he doesn't feel like having to fight Sim once more, and more likely to come and follow them. The Elder Storm tells him how to get back home, to use the amulet Storm to, which can create a mystical gate back to the island they came from. The younger Storm asks what will happen to the older one, and if she won't come along. But the elder one responds by saying that she has nothing to return to. All her friends are dead and someone needs to keep Belasco in check to make sure he doesn't find another exit out of limbo. As they open the mystic gate, Belasco attacks with a horde of demons to try and gain access through the gate. The X-Men are amazed at the magical powers wielded by the elder storm, keeping the horde of demons at bay while they prepare for their return home. Kitty makes a jokingly comment and Wolverine responds a bit more seriously. Belasco then manages to slip by the Elder Storm and grab a hold of young Ileana. Pulls her half out of the gateway and tells Storm to abort the spell, or tear young Ileana apart limb from limb. Colossus looks shocked and worried about his little sister and Kitty manages to grab a hold of Ileana's other arm. Ileana screams out in pain to her older brother to please help her. On the X-Men side of the mystical portal, they've already returned back on Earth, in their own dimension on the island, with Kitty's arm still through the portal to the other side. Colossus is telling Kitty to pull Ileana through because the portal is starting to close. Kitty responds by saying she's trying, but she's lost her grip. She can't feel anything and she shouts she's lost her. She keeps grabbing and feeling around and suddenly she feels her again. But Belasco is pulling just as hard. She tells her teammates to help her as hard as they can because she's not strong enough by herself. All of them together. They manage to pull Ileana through in the end. Ileana, wearing totally different clothes from the moments before, and looking about twice her age, asks if she's really seeing her brother in front of her. Later on the island, the X-Men talk about what had happened and how Moira has examined the kid. It really is Eliana, and she's perfectly healthy, normal, 13-year-old girl. Turned seven years older in the few seconds Kitty lost her grip. Colossus is lost at what he should do and how he can't face their parents to tell them what has happened. Storm says it's probably hard for Pilar, but that he should think about how Eliana must be feeling right now. Colossus responds by saying that's all he's been doing. 
and how he sometimes wishes he had never heard of Charles Xavier in his X-Men. Colossus checks up on his little sister and thinks how unfair and how cruel it is, since a childhood should be a happy time and not spend in limbo for seven years. They don't know yet if she had spent those years with Velasco or with Storm. They don't know what she's seen and endured. He doesn't even know whether to welcome his sister, comfort her, love her or fear her. As he enters Ileana's bedroom, she jumps up from her sleep and Pyotr tells her to not be afraid. Ileana tells him that she feared he had forgotten about her, that he hated her and how she's missed him all those years. She keeps talking to her big brother until she passes out. He takes his seat next to her and gets some sleep himself, but close by, to protect her if the need arises. We then zoom in on Ileana's ancient bloodstone medallion, her special talisman she's had ever since being a young child. A gift from someone who said he loved her. The medallion opens and we see three bloodstones already in place, while deep in Ileana's mind, a voice is heard, echoing the exact words Belasco had said to her. Issue 161 Professor Charles Xavier is not well, not well at all. On the outside he looks calm, catatonic, but in the inside of his mind he is in terror, in pain, in distress. He's faced death before, but this is far worse than he's ever experienced. Somehow an alien consciousness has become part of him. His thoughts, his mind, his very soul are no longer his. Second by second, this other entity is stripping him of his humanity, and no matter how hard he tries, Charles is not able to put a stop to this. The X-Men, along with Moira, Corsair and Sikorsky, are by his bedside. Results of the experiments indicate that Xavier is fighting so hard on the insides, that his body's resources are being drained, and if it's not changing anytime soon, which it doesn't seem to be doing, he will die. Mora tells Cyclops about the suicide attempt Charles performed while he wasn't there. Scott seems shocked and annoyed by this. Kitty and Logan discuss about what's eating Scott, and Wolverine explains how Scott has gone through a similar situation with Jean Grey, the Phoenix. Logan says he understands Scott because they both feel deeply and hide their feelings. He figures they're a lot alike. Corsair wants to approach Scott, being his father, but is strongly advised by Storm to not do so and let her do the talking. Her being his friend, she figures it's best to try and comfort Scott. Corsair complies. Aurora approaches Scott and they mention the nice looking sunset and Storm preference for this base over their old headquarters in New York as an opening for their conversation, which takes a quick turn for the worse. Scott pretty much blames Storm for the X-Men having to lay low on the island after their infiltration of the Pentagon, which did not go unnoticed by the press as Scott shows in a newspaper. He says it's Aurora's fault and a different solution to the privacy problem they were facing should have been considered. Storm responds by saying they needed to undertake action fast. Scott says that he should have been consulted, but Storm responds by saying she's the team leader, not him. Scott says that perhaps it's time he took his old job back, to which Storm responds by saying, all you need to do is ask for it back, if you really want to reclaim that position. She walks off annoyed. Scott asks her to please stay and he says that he's sorry for lashing out. They talk about the negative stuff that seems to happen and that that's sometimes just the way life works. Scott's having a breakdown and he seems to lose everything he's ever cared for, namely the professor, just like he had lost Jean before. Scott asks Aurora to help him, Storm tries to be there for him like friends and teammates should. We then see the Majestrix of the Shi'ar Empire, Lelandra, giving Charles an embrace as if it is the last. Tears fall from her eyes and she says to her beloved one how they had such dreams and that she will not give up on them. She reminisces to how her thoughts reach out to him from across the universe when they first met and she asks Charles to hear her thoughts now. And if he needs her strength, she will gladly give it, as long as he fights. Charles does not respond to her words, nor to her tear that drops on his cheek. In his mind, it's 20 years ago in Haifa, Israel, where he meets up with Daniel Shomron, apparently an old friend of Charles. Daniel asks how his trip to Cairo went and Charles responds by saying it had its memorable moments. Charles had a confrontation with the psychic entity called the Shadow King there, as well as a run-in with a young girl who would later become Storm. They catch up and Daniel says that he's sorry to have heard that Charles and Moira recently broke up. Charles asks how Daniel has been doing and he responds by saying that he's still a psychiatrist but now Holocaust survivors instead of battlefield casualties. And he remembers how well Charles worked with some of the most severe cases back then, how Charles was the best psychologist he had ever seen and how he has needs for Charles' unique talents. 
They drive to Daniel's hospital and introduces Charles to one of the volunteers working there, a man named Magnus. Magnus tells Charles that he has quite the reputation, due to Daniel's opinion of Charles. Charles notices that Magnus's mind is close after Charles' has mental powers, and wonders if Magnus is also a mutant, just like Charles. He sees a number tattooed on Magnus' arms, and Magnus confirms that he was a prisoner in Auschwitz, and how he grew up there. Charles informs about his family, and Magnus responds by saying that he has none anymore. Dr. Shamran says that most of the volunteers have been in camps, one way or another, and that they bring a degree of empathy that can be matched without that kind of experience. He then introduces him to Gabrielle Haller, who had been so traumatized in the camp in Dachau that she withdrew into a catatonic schizophrenia, totally retreated from reality. She came into the hospital in that state and has shown no signs of improvement. They've tried every means of trying to get her out of her trance, apart from the ones that involve physical pains, since she has already endured enough of that. Charles Xavier is Daniel's last resort. Charles says that he can't promise anything, but he'll give us his best shot. He takes a seat in front of Gabrielle, facing her, and unbeknownst to the two men watching, he reaches out with his mind and gently slips into hers. At first he encounters no resistance. He's enveloped in darkness and silence, a barren and desolate surrounding. No awareness whatsoever. He moves deeper into her mind until he hits a wall. Creatures come out of the wall and attack Charles. He figures Gabrielle must have noticed Charles' presence and the monsters are constructs to keep the protective wall intact. This is a sign for Charles that her mind is still functioning. Charles is cautious, because if these monsters would kill him in her mind, he would die in the corporeal world as well. He notices her will is strong and that she's putting up a good fight. Charles then ends up in an ethical dilemma, namely, if she has found peace within herself this way, does he have the right to force her to confront her past and her present? He concludes he does, because life in itself is the greatest of gifts and should not be wasted. Gabrielle must be allowed a full chance to live, to grow, to be all that she can possibly be, despite the horrors that she had to endure. He focuses as a horde of creatures emerge from the wall, but he ignores them, giving the full focus of his telepathic powers on breaking the wall. It starts to crack, line shines through the fissures, and the wall shatters, making way for a glowing bright light. He then experiences the past through Gabrielle's eyes, how she stands in a cramped, packed tightly cattle car, so tight that people suffer and die, but they don't even fall on the floor, they remain on their feet. Her grandmother dies that way, by her side. Once in the camp, the lucky ones are immediately gassed and their remains cremated, but Gabrielle is beautiful and the guards like her. She survives, but is no longer innocent, because of everything she's endured and seen. She starts to wonder if it's her fault to have experienced this kind of horror, if she was wicked or evil and deserves this kind of punishment. She thinks of committing suicide, but lacks the guts to follow it through. She prays for the guards to grow tired of abusing her, and that they will send her to the gas chambers, but it never happens. And in the last days of the war, she's dragged in front of the commandant, and he points a magic wand at her. Tends an obscene spell and Gabrielle is transformed into gold, a metaphor of course. Then, in the physical world, she suddenly screams out at her mama and papa. Magnus and Daniel are amazed at Gabrielle regaining full consciousness. They lay her down in a bed for recovery and Charles says that she's far from fully recovered. The three of them take place in Daniel's office and share drinks to celebrate this progress that Charles has made today with Gabrielle. They talk about what Charles experienced in Gabrielle's mind and how Gabrielle expressed remarkable verbal images of what Charles saw in her mind. While they do so, there's a person outside of the window of Daniel's office eavesdropping on their conversation. That person is surprised at a holler girl being conscious and thinks about how the leader has to be informed since they've been waiting for this moment for years. The person ends his thoughts with sick Heil. In the coming weeks, Gabrielle is starting to come to grips with her new situation, the contrast between child and adulthood and her old life in Holland as opposed to her new one in Israel. She has the aid of her new two companions, Xavier and Magnus. During their travels, Xavier discovers a kinder spirit in Magnus, yet also very different, especially concerning Charles' idea of human evolutionary mutation. Magnus takes a bit more extreme stance in this theory. Xavier realizes this is most likely due to Magnus' deep scars resulting from the experiences during the war. Gabrielle starts to develop feelings for Charles, and Charles, being a telepath, notices this. 
Somewhat reluctantly, he gives in to Gabrielle's flirtations and they share a kiss. Charles pretty much knows that Gabrielle thinks she's in love with him, but he knows for quite certain that she is not. Charles thinks to himself, if it makes them both happy and gives them solace they both seek, why not? While they share the kiss, the hospital suddenly gets attacked. The attackers make their intentions quite clear, namely seize the holler woman, alive and unharmed. A battle ensues between the attackers and the Israeli troops. One of them expresses the hope that they're not Arab commandos or terrorists. Another one of them responds by saying they are not, they're speaking German. The Israelis are outnumbered and Charles tries to leave Gabrielle, who is panicking in fear of yet another war, in a safe spot behind the jeep, while he plans to use his side powers to turn the tide in the battle that's going on. At that moment he gets shot. Gabrielle gets abducted and dragged aboard one of the assault crafts, which leaves the area, while the attackers enter the other one. The second craft is about to take off, but it suddenly gets torn apart into little pieces. Metal shrapnel sprays forth and slaying almost all of the attackers, yet none of the Israeli guards or patients of the hospital. The hospital itself doesn't get damaged either. Charles can still hear the death screams of the attackers in his mind while he gets up from being shot. He sees Magnus on the rooftop of the hospital with some kind of energy surrounding him. The same kind of energy that was surrounding the assault craft right before it exploded. When Magnus comes rushing downstairs, he's worried about Charles, who seems hurt. Xavier says his head still hurts, and he asks Magnus if it was necessary to slaughter the attackers. Magnus responds by saying that they would have done no different to them. He asks Charles if he did not kill in Korea without mercy or hesitation, following the army. Those memories still sicken Charles. Dr. Sharman comes running towards them, telling them they have a prisoner. A prisoner who will not identify himself or the attackers, nor say where they took Gabriel. The prisoner claims he speaks no English. Charles says that that won't be a problem and he enters the prisoner's mind to get the information he needs. He finds out the prisoner is a former Waffen-SS major and now squad leader for something called the Hydra Bruderschaft. Two days later we see a military encampment of mostly German men, the former cream of Hitler's dreaded Schutzstaffel. But at this moment in time they have a new leader, a new insignia and a new cause they follow. This organization is not yet known to the world, but will soon be known as the most ruthless and vicious criminal terrorist cartel in history, Hydra. A trooper comes rushing down the slope, yelling they found something. He informs Herr Baron that the directions they had gotten from the woman were perfect. The Baron reprimands the soldier for being so loud and vocal about their findings, forgives his enthusiasm, but also warns him to not transgress like this again. The Baron then thanks and insults Gabrielle and tells the troopers to bring her along because she should witness the moment of triumph. We see Charles and Magnus wearing stolen Hydra uniforms, and Charles recognizes the Baron as Baron Strucker one of the most wanted Nazi war criminals. An upset Charles can sense the things Strucker did to Gabrielle, how he tortured her to get the wanted information from her. Magnus tells him to calm down, or they will get found out and not be able to help Gabrielle, nor bring Strucker to justice, if Charles keeps acting like a lovesick schoolboy. Charles and Magnus follow Strucker and his troops inside a cave. Strucker tells the story of how the few personal gold reserves were shipped out of Germany in the final days of the war, and hidden deep in Africa, laying there to be used one time in the future to finance the resurgence of the Nazi party and eventually a Fourth Reich. And now Gabriel was turned into a living map to this fault by psychic conditioning. That process, however, drove Gabriel insane and the secrets were lost forever. Charles and Magnus make their plan to rescue Gabriel while the troops move outside the cave and trigger the explosives to break down the wall that hides the gold. Strucker then goes back inside and tells everyone present how this treasure will enable Hydra to conquer the nations they see as their enemies. Where Hitler failed, Hydra shall succeed. Hail Hydra. At this moment, Charles and Magnus make their move. Gabrielle thinks it's a trick and that they will hurt her, telling them to let her go. Magnus tells Charles to use his psi powers to make Gabrielle shut up, and Charles is surprised that Magnus apparently knew about these powers. The troopers notice the intruders and start attacking them with gunfire. Magnus deals with the metal objects, like he did the assault craft before. Charles takes Gabrielle, who ends up in a state of shock, as he uses his powers to visually hide the two of them from the minds of the troopers. He uses his powers further to ignite a fight between troopers, and within minutes everyone is fighting one another. Magnus compliments Xavier on his strategy, but Charles takes no pride in it. Magnus comments on how that mindset will someday cost him dearly. 
Magnus asks how Gabrielle is doing, and Charles tells him she has withdrawn again. He also explains how he's reluctant to my proper again, in fear of her becoming too dependent on the way of resolving matters, how she needs to develop a psychic resilience to cope with the stresses that life brings. They then get attacked by Strucker, wearing some kind of gauntlet nicknamed Satan Claw. A powerful weapon, able to shatter boulders with a single punch. While Xavier tries to protect Gabrielle, Magnus goes head to head with Strucker. Strucker attacks Magnus with the gauntlet, but Magnus tells Strucker he won't be able to slay Magnus as easily as his family was at Auschwitz. With the gauntlet being made of metal, Magnus is able to distort the weapon around Strucker's hand, crushing it. Magnus says he regrets that his powers only started manifesting when the war was already over, or he would have stopped the tyranny. Strucker responds by saying that Magnus might have destroyed Deutschland, and will now maybe destroy him himself, but that the ideals and their great purpose will prevail. Magnus says he doesn't care for the path humanity chooses to take, he knows that once Homo sapiens has destroyed itself, Homo superior will take its rightful place. He blasts away through the top of the cave they're in, and uses his powers to lift Xavier and Gabrielle outside along with the Golden himself. Strucker says he will pay for this, and how he will hunt Magnus down. Magnus leaves, and the cave collapses in on Strucker. Outside, Magnus asks how Gabrielle's doing, and Xavier's not so sure, even though he has established contact. Xavier and Magnus exchange some words. Xavier asks what Magnus will do with all the gold, and Magnus tells Xavier that he's way too naive, and how he's learned that those who love you will turn from you in horror once they found out what you truly are. He also says that if it's up to him, mutants will not go to the gas chambers that easily, and that they will fight, and win. Gabrielle wakes up while Magnus leaves with all the gold. She remembers everything, yet as if it was all a dream. How she was locked up behind a wall, safe, but heard Charles' voice, followed it, and is now happy to be back alive again. We see Xavier waking up from his own comatose state, seeing how he was lost, deep within his mind, with a hideous monster trying to devour him running deeper and deeper within himself, trying to escape from them, but he couldn't. He heard Lilandra's voice, calling him back, giving him hope, giving him strength to survive and triumph. Lilandra responds by saying she only did what any other would have done for the ones in love. The X-Men are of course happy with the recovery of Charles, yet still worried about Ileana and what had happened to her. Lilandra has to leave again because her duty as a Majestrix of the Shi'ar Empire calls. A farewell banquet is arranged and they all join in, apart from Mora, who stays home with Charles and Ileana. The team gets dropped off aboard Lalandra's vessel by the Star Jammers, who will not join in the festivities. Corsa says they respect Lalandra, but they have no love nor trust for the Shuara as a whole. As Lalandra is about to bring her speech, and Wolverine notices familiar sense that put him on edge, Lalandra stutters in mid-sentence, and ends up in the same kind of catatonic state Professor Xavier was in before. The X-Men make plans to go back to Earth, hoping that Professor will be able to help, and at that moment, Deathbird makes her entrance, a coup d'etat once again. The X-Men charge at her, but she seems to be behind some kind of energy field. A bomb goes off, which was hidden underneath the table. When the dust settles, the X-Men are unconscious on the floor, with Deathbird and the Brute standing over them, with the Brute saying how the renegade Deathbird serves them well, as will the X-Men, as hosts for the spawn of their blessed mother of us all. Issue 162 Wolverine is on the run. He thinks he's dying. He's aware he's on an alien planet, but with his brain being on overload, he can't seem to make sense of what his senses are telling him. Too many unknown inputs. So he keeps running and hoping things will get better eventually. Suddenly he's overcome by pain in his gut. He thinks to himself how it's getting worse each time he has it. Like a white hot blade is cutting him. At that moment he gets attacked by one of the alien flora and fauna around him. A tentacle wraps around him and tries to crush his body, which will not work because of his adamantium lace bones, the strongest metal known to mankind. His claws, which he extends, are made of that material as well. 
He rips the creature apart, but does get sprayed by its pollen. They have an hallucinogenic effect on him. He has a vision of him being back in Japan with his loved one Mariko Yoshida. They are riding on horses and are proclaiming their love and affection for one another while sharing a kiss. Logan is aware of eagles heading their way and he notices something is off about them. He slaps his cowboy hat on Mariko's horse and tells her to make way for the tree line, try to get some kind of cover for the eagles. When what Logan thought were birds get closer, he finds out they're brood and they've been hunting for him. One of them shoots Mariko with some kind of beam right in front of Logan. He then wakes up from his vision and finds himself facing actual brood. He's surprised they have found him and the brood tell him he's a fool for thinking they wouldn't. He's one of them and no one can help him and nothing can save him. He jumps away as he gets shot at and makes his way downward which grants him more cover from the flying brood. One of them follows him and he attacks that one. Sleezoids he calls them. The brood with their armor plate like skin, razor sharp teeth and tail stingers loaded with venom are exemplary killing machines with no deadlier being in existence apart from maybe Wolverine himself. More of them come and Wolverine fights them off until the ground they were on collapses. He tries to cling on things but it's no use. He keeps falling, fast. He's thinking to himself that even though his mutant ability of self-healing can survive pretty much any kind of physical trauma, he might not be able to survive an impact from this height. Luckily, he ends up on some kind of spider's web. He passes out for a bit, and when he comes to, he finds himself on what he finds out to be a carcass of one of the brood's living ships. He wasn't able to see much during the night, but as it's dawn now, he has a clear view of his surroundings. The carcass of the ship seems to have been slowly assimilated by the flora and fauna of the planet over the years that it has been lying dead here. The brood that were hunting Wolverine discuss whether they should proceed hunting him or return to the base. One of them says he wants to follow because Wolverine is apparently a host for the Queen. The Huntmaster tells the novice that if he really wants to follow Wolverine and sacrifice himself, the way is clear and his scent is easy to follow. They return to the base. Wolverine, still lying in a web-like construct, is being approached by the creatures who have spun the web. They are coming for their food. Wolverine has another one of the sudden pains in his gut, and as he blinks, he's suddenly back on Lelandra's personal vessel. With everybody just lounging, minutes before death birds could at time. We see Colossus is not in the best of moods, due to what happened to his little sister, and Storm is also having a hard time trying to deal with her meeting her older self and what she had told about her heritage her being bound to the arcane. Then Deathbird and the Brood attack and detonate the bomb. Wolverine thinks back to how he woke up, scrambled and confused, how he heard weird sounds in the background and was flooded with a multitude of scents, sickening scents, and having strange visual displays while he was trying to regain psychic balance and focus. He then wakes up to find him and the others are prisoners of the Brood. The others don't seem to mind, instead they seem to be enjoying themselves. And he finds out why. They are seemingly being held as heroes by the Shi'ar. His mind is confused on how this had happened. It doesn't make any sense to him. He has contradicting thoughts and the harder he tries to sort things out, the more disoriented he got. He gets approached by Carol Danvers, who asks him to dance. He tells her that something's fishy and he thinks they're being set up. Carol tells him that he's probably getting paranoid in his old age and that he should just relax and have fun. Just enjoy the party. Carol then gets approached by two Shi'ar and they tell her that they notice how Carol's physiology is different from the others and how they would like to examine her further. She complies and Wolverine yells out to her, saying that they're brood and not Shi'ar. Logan starts to wonder if he's gone crazy, since he seems to be the only one present who's seeing this. The other X-Men try to calm Wolverine down and they're being presented in front of Lelandra on the stage for their awards as heroes. There's someone standing next to Lelandra and Wolverine feels himself going into autopilot, which happens when he's in a combat situation. He wonders why he's the only one noticing things. The ceremony proceeds, one after the other, the X-Men are embraced by the unknown person. Nothing out of the ordinary seems to happen, until it's Kitty's turn for an embrace. She screams out, asking the X-Men for help, saying how this is impossible and that this cannot be real. She's unable to use her phasing powers and she screams out for Wolverine but he can't seem to help her. Some kind of power keeps him from being able to do something. 
The unknown character tells Kitty to hush and look into her eyes and hear her voice, asking if she's really that horrible to behold. Kitty tells her to please don't, but it's already done. Now it's Wolverine's turn. He's on the platform with just her. He feels as if he is a prey and should do something. Escape, stop her, claw her, but he wasn't able to do anything, it was already too late. He's back on the web, with the creatures closing in on him. He starts to cut loose and ends up in a berserker rage. Aside of Wolverine, the X-Men have not seen of him, and he hopes they will never see it. Him having dealt with one of the creatures makes the rest of the scavengers lose interest in him, since they already have an easy meal right in front of them now. So Wolverine is able to escape. He makes his way up, the way from which he fell, and he figures by the way the brood didn't follow him that they themselves are very aware of the dangers below. While he's making his way up, he notices how he feels lousy, even though he hardly got hurt in the fight with the creatures on the web. He moves slow and his grip is weak, but it gets worse. His nerves are on fire and he's in pain with the slightest move. He keeps pushing on though, which he probably shouldn't be doing and eventually takes a rest, hardly being able to breathe. He lays himself down like an animal does when they're close to dying and he hopes it won't take long. His memory takes him back to the night before, when he woke up from the first painful attack in his gut. He thinks he woke up somewhere else than he actually did and he makes his way to Storm to tell her things aren't alright. She immediately dismisses him and tells him he has been acting strangely ever since her arrival and how it's obvious he is in pain now and ill and that she will get him a physician. Wolverine then knocks her out by pinching the proper nerve to stop her from alarming the wrong people and proceeds on his way. He makes his way to Kitty's room and thinks about how she tried to fight whatever was happening in the throne room. How Kitty, even though she may only be a child, has more smarts and guts than most adults and most heroes. He wants to take her along but he's probably going to have to move hard and fast and he can't guarantee her survival. So he kisses her on the head and whispers her a promise. As he does that, an image flashes through his mind of him holding Kitty in his arms with his hand on her chest and the staccato clicking of his claws going out of his forearms and then retracting again, with the light fading from Kitty's eyes. He wonders what they had done to him to be thinking such things. He makes his way further and he finds out. He witnesses the ceremony, he sees a cadre of the brood having their full attention on Fang, an old foe of the X-Men, a renegade member of the Shi'ar Imperial Guard. Logan enjoys seeing Fang being held captive and he wonders if the brood will reward his treachery with torture or execution. Fang was pleading for his life and the brood just laughed. Somehow Wolverine understands exactly what they're saying. Fang's body begins to smoke and he shrieks. Fang asks why the Brood are doing this, since he served Deathbird and her and the Brood are allies. They respond by saying the Brood need no allies. There are only enemies and slaves. And they tell him that they use Deathbird as they now will use him. Fang starts to transform, as the Brood tell him he had been implanted with the Warrior Prime Brood Egg, which had now reached maturity and is hatching inside of him. How it will consume him, and when the process is done, will absorb the totality of his memories, abilities and genetic potential. How he gave his life for one of the brood to be born. After seeing this, the whole ceremony in the throne room now makes sense to Wolverine. They have all been infected, made host for the queen's eggs. What has now happened to Fang will happen to them all eventually. He screams out. The brood hear this and thus the hunt was on. He gathers his bearings for as much as that is possible he wonders if there's any kind of cure against being infected with an egg. He sees one of the brood and can tell by the markings on his forehead that it's the same brood that was hosted by Fang. He jumps at him with the risk of missing and falling for miles. He then cuts off the brood stingers and tells him to cooperate or he will cut him. The brood knows Wolverine isn't bluffing and plays along while telling Wolverine his fate is sealed. Wolverine has another one of the painful attacks and gets thrown off the brute's back and towards the other brute. They attack him, trying to take him prisoner and not kill him, but they're not successful. As he stands victorious, Wolverine thinks about how he hasn't been able to cut loose like this for a while and how it feels good. He's aware that killing a cadre of the brute is nothing compared to taking out a whole race. At that moment, he has yet another attack. The intensity is nothing like he's ever experienced before, nothing compared to all the injuries he's had before. 
He hungers for the pain to go away. He hungers for oblivion. His body starts to smoke, just like Fangs did. The metamorphosis has begun. Wolverine fights as the egg reaches into his mind, reshaping it into its image, while simultaneously reshaping his body. His adamantium skeleton averts transformation, and Wolverine uses it as an anchor, as a lifeline, while he tries to fight off the transformation. After another night has passed and the sun rises again, Wolverine's mutant immune system has dealt with the queen's egg. It was alien and a parasite, and his body reacted to it like it would to a disease. The strain of the battle inside Logan's body made him sick, and his body was struggling against the takeover. It was a close call, but he won in the end. He then sees the palace where the brood are keeping the X-Men captive, hypnotized and happy. He knows they are infected as well, and wonders if he can even save them. He can't even be sure of whether the metamorphosis has already taken place. He thinks back to the hallucinations he had about killing Kitty, and if he has to, if she can't be cured, he will. He'll kill them all. And then, when he's done, it'll be the Sleazor's turn. Issue 162 Carol Danvers is being experimented on. The Brood have separated her from the rest of the X-Men because her DNA appears to be different from that of the mutants, as well as that of regular baseline humans. The X-Men have all been implanted with the Brood Egg, which will result in the Brood's hatchling having absorbed all the powers and genetic material of their individual hosts. With Carol being so unique, they are subjecting her to evolutionary modifications to determine the ramifications of their findings. They seem to be able to alter her physical form at will, but they're fascinated by her psychic resistance. Even though she seems to be enjoying the pain she's experiencing, she remains conscious and is aware of all that happens. Brood are impressed by her defiant resilience. One of the brood gets sent on an errand, and as it leaves, we see Wolverine hiding in the shadows. It took him a day and a night to arrive in Slezoid City, and he's picked up Carol's scent, which brought him to the lab. He remembers how she got carried off by brute scientists and is not sure which would be worse, to find her dead or alive. He follows the brute and takes out the Illuminators. The brute is surprised by this and asks what's going on and who's there. Wolverine introduces himself, pops his claws and fights the brute, who puts up a good fight. Wolverine throws the brute through a window, right in the middle of the rest of the brute. One of them tells the others to slay him and Wolverine says he was hoping they'd say that. Wolverine is a warrior, by birth, training and choice, the best there is. As one of the X-Men he is now a superhero, but before that he was a Canadian Secret Service agent and a commando. With him being a mutant with fast healing and very accurate senses, combined with the adamantium claws and skeleton which makes his bones nearly unbreakable, he's the perfect warrior. After having dealt with the brute he finds Carol, who tells him that there is a fire burning within her, so bright and beautiful. She asks Wolverine to help her, but he has no idea how to. He tells her she'll be alright, even though she's had a rough ride. He thinks to himself how that is a lie, because he knows she isn't alright at all. And she knows it too. She looks normal, but her scent has been changed. She's no longer human, and that scares them both. Carol grabs a gun, while telling Logan how it's strange that after all she's been through, she feels like she's bursting with energy and feels better than she's done in a long while. They make their way to whatever lies ahead of them. We then switch to the place where Xavier's mansion used to stand. It's being rebuilt and Lorna Dane, also known as Polaris, is present, as a transporter beam drops Corsair and Havoc, father and son, on Earth. Lorna asks her lover what the news is, and Alex responds by saying it's lousy. Alex tells her that the captured X-Men have been traded off to the Brood by Deathbird, who used them as a leverage to have the Brood help her in seizing the Shi'ar throne with her coup d'etat. He also tells her that the Brood took the X-Men to their homeworld, wherever that may be. They have no idea. Alex lashes out at some construction beams lying around with his blast. Corsair is alarmed and thinks they are under attack and summons his hand blasters by tapping the jewels on his costume. Alex apologizes and tells him it's his fault. Corsair tells the son it's alright and how they all need to blow off some steam. 
Moira McTaggart, who is also present, notices how Corsair is somewhat jumpy and asks him what his plans are. He responds by saying his other son has been kidnapped and that he intends on rescuing him. Either that or avenge him. Moira says that Alex will want to go along with him, but Corsair doesn't want him to. Apart from him not wanting to potentially lose another son, the mission will involve killing. Corsair is used to that, Alex is not. Corsair tells Moira that they will be on their way soon, but he wanted to say goodbye to both her and the professor. She then tells him that Charles isn't around and that he's taking all this very hard. Not because his X-Men are in danger per se, but more so because for all of his power he's unable to do anything for any of them. He lost the woman he loves, and in the X-Men he also lost the family he loves. And that he feels very alone now. That even the strongest person has a breaking point. Moira fears that this might be it. She wishes Corsair good luck as he beams back up to the ship. At that moment Cyclops, Corsair's other son, is running for his life. He's being chased by the Brood Hunters. He's confused on where he is, but he knows for certain that it isn't Earth. While he tries fighting them off, he wonders if the others are alright. At that moment he gets hailed by Storm and the other X-Men on the shore. Apparently they are not X-Men at all, but Brood posing as X-Men. He gets greeted by the one posing as Colossus and he says, Welcome sister, we have been eagerly awaiting you. Cyclops flashes out with his eye beam. As he does so, he sees his own reflection and he resembles a Brood as well. The Brood tell him he's been implanted with an egg and how there's no power in the universe that can save him. He gets attacked by the other brood and they strip away his humanity, revealing the young queen nestling in his soul. She draws him in and he doesn't resist. He's filled with despair as two big hands push the brood aside. Cyclops sees his Professor X and asks him if he's gone insane. He asks for the professor to help him. Xavier tells him that he's given him all the help he needs from when he first trained Scott. Scott realizes the images are just that, threatening and seemingly real only if he allows them to be. He wakes up from what appears to be a dream, but he instantly seems to forget what he was dreaming about. He can tell from the amount of moons in the night sky that they're far away from home. He does remember that they were supposed to be on Lelandra's homeworld, but this place looks nothing like how Xavier described it to Scott. He finds Storm sitting in a trance. He approaches her but does not want to disturb her, because that might prove dangerous. He thinks back to how they were supposed to be honored for rescuing Lelandra, but he notices his clothes are torn apart and how his nightmares indicate some kind of psychic conflict. He wonders if they're being manipulated. As he observes Storm, he notices some form of energy around Storm, in the form of one of the creatures from his nightmares. The creature seems to be smiling at Scott. A lightning bolt flashes in the sky and the image Scott was seeing fades away. He wonders if this was Storm's doing and if she's having a nightmare like he was having. He feels he needs to wake her up, and does so. She's crying as she wakes up. She was lost, no longer herself, and at war with herself, without knowing why. Scott tries to comfort her, but his words are fairly hollow. He thinks of himself as scared he is, and how beaten he feels they are. That no matter what they do, there seems to be no hope. He tells Storm that they have to find the others, but has no idea where to go from there. At that moment, Carol and Logan arrive, and Aurora notices Logan's skin. He tells her it's not a pretty story, but it can wait. What they need to do now is to get themselves off the planet. Logan fills Scott in on what he found out about the Brood City, the carcass is built on, how big it is, and where Lelandra's vessel is located. If they can reach that, they can leave the planet. Soon they find the other X-Men and split up in two different squads. Colossus, Nightcrawler and Kitty are still under the influence of the Brood, and their perceptions are off from the reality they're in. Wolverine, Cyclops, Carol and Colossus make their way down the corridors of the Hive. They follow Wolverine, who is on the trail of Lelandra's scent. Colossus feels like they're still in Lelandra's place, due to the influence of the Brood. Cyclops notices something is bothering Wolverine, but he won't talk about it. He figures it has something to do with the way Logan's skin looks. Carol notices the walls appear to be a result of a natural organic process, and not something that's been constructed. But to Colossus, they feel as normal walls. They feel like they're made out of metal to him. Wolverine is still trying to figure out the best way of dealing with his dilemma. Namely dealing with his friends being implanted with brood eggs. They come at a point where they can go either of two routes. One leads to where Lelandra is being held, the other leads them smack dab to the place where the brood's great mother is hiding out. Wolverine wants to get in there and slay the brood queen. But Cyclops tells him to leave her be, because the objective is getting Lelandra out of there. 
As Wolverine and Cyclops argue about whether or not to kill during war, Carol warns them to postpone their discussion since they're getting attacked by a full contingent of brood hunters. During the battle, Cyclops wonders why the brood leader told them specifically to take the humans alive. Them holding back gives the X-Men a slight advantage. Carol breaks away from the fight as she tries to free Lilandra. Wolverine tells Cyclops to back him up because he's heading for the Queen's Chamber. Cyclops tells Wolverine to stick with him and not go after the Queen. Wolverine doesn't listen and confronts the Queen. The Queen immediately senses the egg implant no longer being inside of Wolverine. He attacks the Queen and the brood reinforcements arrive on the scene. Colossus's mind starts to clear up and he can see how the newly arrived enemies are not the same race as Lelandra is. Carol was successful in liberating Lelandra and they arrive as well, carrying blasters and they shoot away at the brood. Carol then suggests a tactical withdrawal to Cyclops, since they got what they came for. Lelandra has been liberated. Cyclops then tells the X-Men to retreat, but Wolverine is not having it. He wants to kill the Queen, end this war. They argue and Wolverine tells Cyclops to leave already. He's staying there. He says they're as good as dead anyways, thanks to the Queen, and all he cares about is killing her. Storm Squad is making progress towards the spacecraft of Lelandra. She's flying up in the air with Kurt and Kitty clinging on. She's trying to get the two as high up in the air as possible, the closest she can to the spacecraft, so that Kurt can teleport the last part. Kurt tells Kitty to hold her breath as he teleports the two next to the hull of Lelandra's vessel. Storm's being shot at by a brute patrol craft as she lures them away from Kitty and Kurt. Kitty faces inside the ship, while Kurt stays on the outside, clinging on through the hull of the ship. He's somewhat confused since teleporting himself and Kitty took a lot out of him, when he was just getting used to carrying others along with him. Kitty's job inside the ship is to open the airlock and let Kurt inside. She only has a couple of minutes to do so, because Kurt will either suffocate or freeze to death, being this high up in the planet's atmosphere. Kurt could not teleport inside, in fear of teleporting into something solid, so Kitty has to find her way on her own and help Kurt inside. She finds the airlock she was looking for, but she gets jumped by one of the brood. He tells her to yield or suffer the consequences. This is Kitty's first encounter with the Brood as far as she is aware of, but Wolverine and Storm told her all about them. She's still impressed by the sight of one close up though. The Brood tries to sting her with his venom, while he tells her that he is only trying to capture her alive since he's been ordered to do so. The Brood tells Kitty she's trapped now, but apparently the Brood hadn't seen Kitty enter the hall using her phasing powers, or he would have known differently. Kitty then heads for the control panel. Using the knowledge of the Shi'ar technology she received from Professor X's info dump when she and Nightcrawler were taken as hostages by the Shi'ar. The airlock needs one door to be closed before the other one can be opened to let Nightcrawler in. Kitty hopes and prays that the first door will close and lock before the Sleezoid gets any closer. Her plan is to open the door while phasing, propelling the brood into deep space due to the explosive decompression. But Kitty's moral compass concludes that that would be murder and she can't perform an act like that. The Brute tells her to get away from the controls, but Kitty tells her Brute to leave or she will kill them both. He calls her bluff and attacks her. His stingers face right through her and he is surprised by this, yet he makes another attempt to correct this attack and tries to grab her once more. One of its tentacles accidentally slaps the control panel and the airlock opens up, ejecting him miles away from the spacecraft. As Kitty drags a lifeless and ice-cold Kurt inside, she's dealing with her feelings of guilt for most likely killing the brood. She thinks about Wolverine probably complimenting her on her actions, but she doesn't want to become like him in that regard. The other X-Men and Carol and Lelandra are still fighting the brood and the queen. Cyclops once more tries to tell Wolverine to not kill the queen, but Lelandra tells Cyclops that he's being a fool. This is a war, a war against the deadliest of enemies, life and death. No room for chivalry and honor, just defeat or victory. Wolverine agrees and just as he's about to stab his claws through the Queen's skull, they get transported out by a beam and the lander's vessel ignites and lifts off. They are now off the planet. Not yet out of harm's way, still within the gravity field of this part of the universe sun, so they're still not able to shift into warp space. Thus still vulnerable. Cyclops and Lelandra discuss on the vessel's firepower and their chance of escaping unnoticed and their chance of survival as a whole. Wolverine is still angry at Scott for not helping him in going after the brute and killing her immediately. Kitty asks why he's so angry and hates the Queen so much, and how she's glad he didn't kill her. Apparently she's still somewhat under the influence. As Wolverine looks at his fellow X-Men with a heavy heart, 
He's about to tell them why he's so angry and worried about his friends, what exactly the Brood Queen did to them all. But right as he's about to tell them, the vessel's being aimed at, and the command to open fire is given. Issue 164. The X-Men are under attack. They're in Lelandra's royal vessel and the Brood are in pursuit, with multiple spaceships and warning shots being fired by the Brood. As they are not able to get any kind of contact with the people aboard his ship, the Huntmaster is requesting instructions from the Great Mother. She tells the Huntmaster that the humans are to be captured alive, with the exception of Wolverine. Since he somehow seems to have been able to get rid of the egg in his host body, he may be slain. The Great Mother does not want any of her eggs to be lost, and any kind of sacrifice is acceptable in trying to rescue them. If the Huntmaster fails, he himself will get slain. Aboard Lelandra's ship, Cyclops, Lelandra and Storm are discussing what their options are inside this ship, which is a pleasure craft, and not a fighter craft unlike the ships which are shooting at them. Those ships are a lot more maneuverable and have a higher maximum velocity as long as they are still not able to shift into warp space. Carol and Cyclops notice how the Brutes seem to deliberately be missing their shots and they wonder why that is. Scott has been aware of the Brute handling the X-Men with kid gloves, ever since they've escaped. Lelandra tells Scott that her spaceship does have some firepower but not a whole lot. He sends Pyotr, Carol and Logan to man the weapons, while Kitty looks after the still hurt Kurt. Carol and Logan seem to be able to figure out the controls. Even though it's alien technology, it seems fairly simple, resembling an arcade game. Pyotr asks if it's really necessary for them to kill, and Logan responds by saying, it's us or them, Petey. And according to Wolverine, the Brood are just the predatory alien race that deserves to be killed. He thinks himself that at least he can avenge the X-Men that way, since he regrettably might not have a way to save them. They start firing away and Colossus starts to doubt himself. Apart from him not having the necessary aiming and firing skills, as opposed to Carol and Wolverine, he also notices that even though the X-Men are his comrades and doesn't want to fail them, and that the Brood are purely evil, there's something inside of him that keeps wishing for another way. Cyclops has placed himself at a spot where he can fire the optic force blast through the temporarily created ruby quartz extrusion without damaging the hull of the ship. He once again thinks about Wolverine knowing, but not wanting to tell what's going on and how he will have to try and make Logan talk after this ordeal is done. That's something he's specifically looking forward to. He starts blasting at the Bruce fighter ships, trying not to hurt them, but just forcing them to disengage. They seem to be alive, just like the starships the Brood are using. On the other side of the ship, Storm's having an inner monologue about how her powers are seriously being hampered by them being in outer space. She reverts to using lightning attacks, but does not want to hurt the ships, only the Brood. Even though she's vowed never to take a life, in the case of the Brood, she's very much tempted to break that vow. As she's trying to control the lightning bolt attacks, she loses her grip and kills all the ships directly surrounding them by accident. The rest of the brood pour on the attacks, since the Shi'ar vessel's shields seem to be buckling. On the inside of the ship, due to the attacks, the control panel Lelandra is sitting at starts a malfunction. More specifically, the warp drive controls. She tells Kitty and Kurt that some repair work will have to be done, but can be done on the inside. Someone has to do a spacewalk on the outside of the ship and do the repairs. Nightcrawler volunteers, but Kitty overrules him by saying he can hardly stand up. And aside from that, what will he do when the Brute starts directly attacking him? Duck? Scott picked up on Kitty's plans to go outside the ship, and he objects. He thinks it's way too dangerous. Kitty tells him that that's ridiculous. She's the only one of them that can face out of harm's way, if necessary. Just the same way she faces inside the pressure suit while she's talking to him. Lelandra can guide Kitty through the work that needs to be done by using the suit's built-in camera and radio. She promises Scott she'll be careful and will be just fine. She faces through the ship's hull, 
bringing along all the necessary tools, making our way to the spot where the repairs need to be done. Very aware of the fact that the slightest misstep will throw her off the ship and they won't be able to come after her. We then see a short instance of Carol getting dizzy and having blurry eyesight. Seeing colors and images she never dreamed possible. She figures it's a residue from the treatment the brood have given her before. It seems to be a minor episode and doesn't last for very long. The brood notice Kitty walking on the outside of the ship and starts shooting at her. They don't care if she loses grip and floats away in space. They'll just as easily pick her up and capture her again. Their beams go right through Kitty though. However, even though Kitty has done this oftentimes before, it never gets easier on her. She keeps fearing, what will happen at the time my power doesn't work? She somewhat regrets her opening her big mouth and volunteering in doing this. She's just a kid. At that moment she realizes that she's not a kid at all. Instead, she's an X-Men. She's earned a spot on the team, and this is just one more example and a proof of why. The Brood conclude that since the ship hasn't activated its warp drive, they must be crippling the ship. They close in on them. Cyclops notices how their own firepower is slacking and how they're being hit from all sides. He hails Storm to ask her what's going on. She responds by saying that she's lost total control over her powers and her powers no longer yield to her will. She knows that deep inside that if she does use her powers, she will kill again and she can't bear that thought. We see that Carol apparently had another episode and starts sweating. Kitty gets hit by shrapnel flying around. She didn't see it coming, so she didn't phase. The suit closed itself, so she didn't lose a lot of air. She is bleeding though, even though she thinks it's nothing serious, apart from the fact that it does hurt a lot. Lelandra calls off Kitty's mission, but Kitty tells her no. She wants to finish the assignment. Just a couple of more minutes. Just a couple of more minutes. Or the rest of her life. Carol's having another episode that lasts quite a while longer than the previous one. Years ago, she got transformed into Miss Marvel due to a freak accident which combined her human genetic elements with that of the alien Kree race. A couple of months ago, she lost her powers when she got attacked and drained by rope, yet her hybrid genetic material remained, according to the experiments which were done on her. Now, a couple of days ago, the experimentation the boot performed on her apparently triggered the dormant untapped potential. And that potential is being fully realized now. Carol cries out, in wonder more than in fear, while a blinding light flares within her soul. It's the thing outside of her that instantly becomes a part of her, forming a union between them. A union that will last until death. That light is pure power, and Carol uses it without hesitation, aiming it at all the ships that were attacking Lelandra's royal vessel. While this was happening, Kitty was able to fix the damage which was done to the warp drive and tells Lelandra to throw them into warp. The ship enters warp, but is Kitty on board? We then switch back to Earth, to Salem Center, New York, where the Xavier School for Gifted Youngsters is located. Even though the school has been fully rebuilt, even better than before thanks to the robots provided by Lelandra, it's actually no longer a school. He started the school in support of his dream of humans and mutants living together in harmony. The students of the school eventually became the X-Men. And even though they often became hated and feared by regular humans, they have sworn to protect and save those very same people. Over the years, his students became his surrogate children, whom he loved with all his heart. With the fairly recent abduction, no contact, and quite possibly the death of his X-Men, his nights have become haunted and he feels guilty. Their blood is on his hands. The dream may still be good, but the dreamer is done. At this moment, there are only two people in the mansion. Him and Ilyana. Ilyana has been finding her way back again, after not having been around for seven years while she had been in limbo. She says how it's almost the same as she remembers it, even though it's a bit spooky, being so empty with just the two of them there. Charles tells her that Mora will be coming back on Monday. They have a talk during dinner about how Ilyana sometimes sort of hears Charles's voice in her head, even though he's not around, and about how she was only able to speak Russian when she was abducted, and since she has returned, she woke up one day and she was able to speak English perfectly. Xavier explains he thought her while she was asleep, and she asks how. He explains to Ilyana that he is a mutant, like her brother, but his powers are telepathically. 
She asks him if he knows what she's thinking, but Charles assures her that he doesn't mind scanning people indiscriminately. Her secrets are safe from him. Ileana then asks if she is a mutant as well. Xavier says he doesn't know, but she could be. She then teases him by saying that she can do neat things as well. Xavier senses a strong psionic shield and wonders if it's a natural one, but he doubts it. Moira has told him about Ileana's abduction by Belasco and that they didn't know what kind of things she's experienced there. It's something worth finding out. It all intrigues Professor X somewhat, but in the current depressed emotional state he is in right now, he doesn't care enough to put the effort in. Let Moira deal with it. He just wants to be left alone. Back in space, Kitty wakes up, realizing she's hurting so much that she has to be alive. She looks around, but all she can see is an all-encompassing bright light. It emanates from a figure she recognizes as Carol. They both return aboard the ship and catch up with the new status quo. Cyclops, Storm, Lilandra and Carol discuss on what steps to take next, while Nightcrawler and Colossus care for Kitty. Kitty says that she thought Carol was so beautiful, she thought she was an angel. She also says that she feels cold, and Kurt tells her that they are all cold. Lilandra explains that Kitty's repair work fixed the warp drive, but it was pretty much the ship's last breath because the ship has lost main and auxiliary power. Thus, there is no life support. She also explains that if they don't find a way to regenerate the matter and antimatter cores, they will all freeze or suffocate. Very soon. Storm asks if she and Cyclops will be able to do that with their powers, but Carol knows exactly what to do. She knows Storm and Cyclops' power will not be enough energy to regenerate the cores. So she heads down there herself, reaches deep within herself to her newfound powers which seem to feel as all this time itself, and she releases the power, regenerating the course, but it takes a toll on Carol. She's drained from it, and apparently they've discovered the upper limit of her new powers. Lelandra tells everyone to get the rest. When they wake up, they will get a meal, and then it's time to get some work done. During repair work on the outside of the ship, Colossus and Carol share some thoughts. She tells Colossus about the cosmic awareness her old friend Captain Marvel had, how that worked, becoming one with the universe, and how she thinks she's even gone beyond that. Not a spiritual merger with the universe, but an actual physical one. She feels that she taps into a white hole when she uses her powers, that the source she draws her energy from is the primal fabric of the universe. She can generate heat, light, all kinds of radiation, gravity, and the whole way she perceives things around her has totally changed. She can't really explain the way she sees things around her now, but it's wonderful. Colossus tells her that she sounds happy, and that her abilities would be invaluable to the X-Men. She declines the invitation though. Regardless of her being a friend of the team for a long time, it would mean returning to the Earth with the team. She tells him that from when she was a teenager, she had always wanted to become an astronaut. Explore space, discover new worlds and alien civilizations. She almost made it as Miss Marvel before she lost her powers. And returning back to Earth, joining the X-Men, would mean rejecting her heart's desire. Alternatively, staying in space would mean leaving everyone and everything she's come to love on Earth behind. She tells Colossus that Earth was Carol Danvers' home, but that she fears that Earth is no place for binary. On the inside of the ship, Kurt is checking up with Kitty's recovery. He concludes that she is doing better than before, but is still not fully recovered yet. Kitty says she's fine and feels rotten for not assisting in the repair work. They joke around a bit, and Kurt seriously urges Kitty to get back into bed until she's fully recovered. Kitty reluctantly does so. Kurt then teleports to Cyclops and Lelandra, asking how long it will take for the Mediscan systems to be operational again. Scott asks why and if there's a problem. Kurt explains to Scott that he wonders what cured Kitty, because he has no clue. With her being punctured by shrapnel, and thus having radioactive elements in her bloodstream, and being on the outside of the hull during warp transition, she probably absorbed enough hard radiation to kill a person. Normally a human being would not have survived an ordeal like that. 
We want to find out what the reason is for a miraculous recovery. Wolverine enters and tells him that some questions are best left unanswered. Cyclops asks Wolverine what that's supposed to mean. Wolverine once again asks Cyclops why he didn't help him in killing the Brood Queen. Things get heated and Wolverine pops his claws out of anger. He immediately apologizes to Scott and walks out frustrated. Kurt wants to go after him and talk to him, since they're good friends, but Scott tells him to stay here and help Lilandra. We then switch to Storm, who is in the shuttle bay and is troubled with her not being in tune with her surroundings. At first she thought it was because of the brood world being so corrupted, but now she fears the problem lies inside of her. Some element is disrupting the harmony in her mind, body and soul. She plans on finding out what it is exactly and to set it straight before it's too late. Being in the shuttle bay gives her enough space to fly around a bit. She uses her powers to lift herself up and as she does, she suddenly feels a pain in her body, loses concentration and falls back on the floor of the ship. Scott has been watching her for a couple of seconds and runs towards her. Aurora tells him that she's fine even though she's crying her eyes out and just wants to be left alone. He tells her that something is tearing the team apart and they have to figure out what's going on, together, as a team. Aurora explains how she's linked, due to her powers, with the atmosphere around her. That she's bound to the primal force of the living world. She feels as if she's wasting away, being so far away from the earth. The longer she stays away from home, the more lost she will become. She tries to explain how everything around her annoys her, being inside the ship, surrounded by nothing organic, and that she can't even draw from the love and joy she had for her teammates. Scott doesn't understand because they haven't changed, but Storm tells him she's changing. Ever since her escape from the brood, she felt something deep inside of her, in the core of her being. She doesn't know the exact cause, nor the final effect it will have. She then collapses, and Scott tells her he's calling Nightcrawler, and that she's sick and should be in bed. She then has an epiphany, when she realizes the difference between the way she's feeling, and Kitty's miraculous recovery. She realizes she's carrying a child. She probes inside herself and starts to panic and lash out. She blasts Cyclops outside of the shuttle bay with a gust of wind, and she shuts the doors to the bay. Scott can see her leaving inside of the shuttle. She apparently left the costume behind on the floor, to Scott's surprise. Scott tells Carol to hurry up and follow her, before she disappears out of sight. Wolverine is being snappy, saying that's probably exactly what she's trying to do, with good reason. Scott says he's not in the mood for games, and tells Wolverine to explain himself. It's long overdue especially with what's going on now. Wolverine then explains what he found out, what he experienced. He tried to tell everyone before, but he simply couldn't. It hurt him too much to tell his friends, they've all been implanted with brood eggs. He tells them all that he had thought of killing them all, to spare them the transformation. But he couldn't push himself to do that either, because there's still hope. They might get lucky, run into a miracle or whatever. He tells them that the eggs are not removable surgically, that they are bound to their nervous systems. And when it hatches, it will reshape the host body into a brute, absorbing the host's abilities. He also explains how he felt guilty for him being the only one with the mutant ability of a healing factor, which allowed him to survive and destroy the egg. He tells them that the embryos of the queen have a certain degree of awareness concerning their hosts, that they will take any steps necessary to make sure the hosts survive when being threatened. And that's the reason why Kitty healed as fast as she did. Dead hosts are no use to them. But that awareness can also make them do very nasty things, Wolverine tells them. Carol reacts by saying they don't even know the meaning of the word nasty. In a rage, she leaves the ship, without thinking, not using a hatch, but right through the hull, leaving behind a huge hole and a following explosive decompression, launching the X-Men and Lelandra outside of the ship with immense force. Thanks for watching this video and I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please consider liking this video and subscribing to the channel if you haven't done so already, because that really helps me out in growing this channel and being able to produce more videos like this one. See you next episode!